is just after nine, so I'm going to ask everyone to start taking their seats and getting ready to start the meeting. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Happy April 13th. Um, we will now begin this BART board meeting. Um, uh, Assistant District Secretary, I think is your title. Um, can you go ahead and take roll, please? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Director Simon. Here. Director Allen. Here. Director Ames. Here. Director Defty. Vice President Foley? Present. Director McPartland? Here. Director Rayburn? Here. Director Saltzman? Here. President Lee? Here. Thank you, a quorum is present. Great. Um, I'm so grateful to have us all back here. I know Director Simon is on her way, so Director McPartland, can you lead us in the pledge, please? <laughs> to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I know we do have a special guest today who is currently en route. Um, so we will come back to that item unless my board colleagues have any other special guests they would like to introduce today. Um, if not, uh, we will now go on to the report of the board president. Uh, I just have two very quick things to note. <clears throat> One is that um, board colleagues, um, you should have received an email from our district secretary, April Quintanilla, I think yesterday, um, regarding follow-ups with information um, around our conversation with redistricting and uh, representation um, that I think is responding to almost everything that had come out of just questions and you know, clarifications that had come out of our discussion in our last board meeting. Um, I am not yet ready to bring that resolution back to this board. Um, I think I need to do a little bit more thinking and a little bit more conversation um, before I'm ready, but I, I hope to bring back a resolution that is um, as inclusive as possible of all the feedback that you all shared. Um, I should do that in the next month or so. And then the second thing is um, I really want to thank my board colleagues for really taking the time to go through the inspector general recruitment process. Um, the main update I have is that we have gone through a very um, positive interview process over the last few weeks, really expedited everything we possibly could on our end. And we have now submitted three names to the governor and the governor's appointments secretary. Um, I joined BART staff. Um, thank you so much to our AGM of External Affairs, Rod Lee, and our AGM of Administration, Alaric de Graffenried, um, for helping to set up a meeting with the Governor's Appointments Secretary, Catherine Rivera, yesterday. It was a very positive call. Um, so we look forward to um, hearing back from them, hopefully, in the near future. Um, that concludes my board, um, report of the board president. I will now um, move to any public comment. I do see one hand raised. Let me check and see if it's for this item. One moment. Fran Quiddle, would you like to speak on this item, the report from the board president? I, um, I have a comment about BART, and I am at this meeting to offer public comment. So tell me okay. when I speak. Yes, public comment is item seven. So if you can pause a moment and you'll hear the announcement shortly. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. No further public comment. All right, thank you. Um, seeing no public comment, we'll now move on to 4A. This is a uh, board matter that was continued from our February 9th meeting. Um, we have a very, very extra special guest in the room with us today, um, but I will pass it over to Director Dufty to take us away. Good morning, everyone, and we're welcoming 
Laverta Allen and her daughter, Shotzi Jefferson, here. Colleagues, I'm very honored to have the opportunity to... <laughs> This is a wonderful day for BART, and it is a wonderful opportunity to recognize a true trailblazer who has done so much. And when I think of Laverta Allen, I think of someone who reaches out and always wants to help BART do the right thing. And um, Laverta operates not on the basis of self-interest, but on the basis of public interest and uh, making BART and, and any agency that she has touched, many of which around the Bay Area, more equitable, more fair, more effective, and so we have a resolution before us uh, honoring and recognizing the accomplishments over many wonderful decades. And I thought if that is okay, Madam President, I'll have uh, Laverta speak first and then we'll take action on the resolution. Good morning and thank you so much for being with us. First of all, I'm quite honored. And I was reflecting on how I got to BART uh, some many years ago. When Margaret Pryor called me, I was in New York, and said, well, you've been to the BART talking about how bad we are in every day. How would you like it if you had a chance to help us? And I said, well, Margaret, what are you talking about? I did not know Margaret. I knew Will Ursery much better, because he'd been head of the War on Poverty program in the city of Berkeley. So I knew him quite well, but not Margaret. So I said, well, let me think about it. She says, well, I'm going to have Bechtel call you and talk to you. Well, of course, uh, Gefford called me from Bechtel, and I was in New York, and I said, oh, well, let's see. What are you going to do? That was when we did the first expansion. Of course, I had opposed putting BART underground in Berkeley because I thought it was a racist issue that made them decide to put it underground. And with Ron Dellums, I had walked many blocks underneath the city of Berkeley and counted the people who looked like me working there. And I'd like to tell you it was zero at that time. And I was not happy, so I did not support putting BART underground. So I came back uh, with Margaret's insistence that I do that. And the first thing Beck uh, the Bechtel guy said to me was, well, how much will it cost us for you to sign your report monthly? I thought, well, God, you must be crazy. <laughs> There's no way you're going to write a report that I'm going to sign that I didn't have anything to do with it. So I didn't say anything to him on the phone. I said, well, I will come over to your office. I'll be back next week, and I'll do that. He was on the 13th floor. I'll never forget that. I went up on the 13th floor to meet with him, and so he proceeded to tell me that they would prepare my report, and I would come and sign it monthly for them. And how much was that going to cost him? And maybe some of you are old enough to remember, we used to have a very famous uh, placement agency in, uh, in the area. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, called Kelly Girl. <laughs> I said, well, maybe you should be contracting with Kelly Girl and not with me. They provide that kind of service for you. So, at <laughs> any rate, I've had a wonderful experience working with Bart. I've worked with almost every civil rights director you've had since I have been here, and I've had a wonderful time working with them. I've worked with all the general managers and I've managed to get along well with some of them, even when I was giving them a few words of wisdom uh, that I like to call. And I see my friend Matt here, his mother and I were good friends. And uh, I've taught Matt a little bit about law. <laughs> and a little bit about construction law, especially. <laughs> 
<laughs> I go. So I've had a wonderful time. Uh, we've had some wonderful people to work with. Uh, some have been nice, some not so nice. And it didn't really matter to me whether they were nice or not, because as far as I was concerned, they were all nice, and they were going to march down the same hallway I marched. Uh, I used to go to BART and walk around and count where people of color were sitting at BART. And I would tell them, you know, in the uh, federal government, uh, you tell who got clout by whether or not they have windows. Matt has heard me say that many times. <laughs> and so I used to walk the floors of BART and find out how many people of color sat in the office with a window or whether they were in the middle of the floor. If they were in the middle of the floor, I knew I didn't need to waste my time talking to them. So I've learned a lot working with BART. I think the people that work for BART has learned a lot about where I was coming from and what I was interested in. And not just for the Allen Group or for Laverta Allen. I came to BART with a long history of trying to change labor, trying to change education. And some of you know that I am an educator by profession. But uh, so I've had a wonderful time. And I thank you for giving me more than two minutes, Bevan. <laughs> well, that's what happens now and again. <laughs> and let me say that I think for us as a board, um, so much of your history is our history. And so it's wonderful that you can be here today and be recognized that you, you couldn't always be nice as it related to, to working with Bart, but you got the job done. And uh, we appreciate that. Colleagues, uh, um, certainly. Okay. Um, I just want to say, take one moment and say something that I really appreciate the BART board and all the directors and you know the management uh, recognizing my mother because she is the most courageous person that I know. She's not afraid to speak the truth as she sees it and as our society should blend you know together better. We're in really bad times now, but I did want to take this opportunity because we're we're always complaining you know about everything, but I do want to. Uh, have the board of directors recognize the hard work that my mother has done is now I think coming to fruition. You know, here at Bart, it's been a very, very long road, but I recently had a difficult time getting a young African American engineer placed, you know, on a position he should have been placed on. And I really want to compliment Sylvia Lamb, who is new in her position. Is Sylvia here? Oh, there's Sylvia. Uh, but I really want to compliment Syl Sylvia because in all the years, I've been here over 33 years, you know, working at BART consistently. And um, she's the only person that came to me in her position that said, I want to change the culture. I wanted to change what we see here at BART. And I really applaud her for her having that courage. She has a difficult job. But I did want to introduce this one young man. Is Tony here? Oh, Tony, come on up. This is a young African-American engineer who just started working in the BART building. He's not my employee, but he was an intern for me, and he has a degree in electrical engineering. And Tony, I just really wanted to uh, introduce you to the board because he is a, an example. And you know, this year, BART is bringing in probably five or six African-American uh, young engineers in the internship program because I think we have to grow, you know, our workforce from the younger, you know, people uh, growing up. But at least BART is now open to seeing that it's a problem, that it has been a problem in the past. And now with Bob's help and the board of directors help, I think we're going to be seeing some some changes. So with that, I just wanted to. Congratulations and welcome to BART. We, we're we're thrilled Bart. that you're here. I do want to say that um, as, as serious as we've been, you have an agenda that hasn't finished yet. And so I do want to acknowledge that you continue to work with BART on supportive housing for special populations and that you bring a lot of passion um, to the cause. And so I appreciate all the times you've reached out. And Well, I don't intend to go home and sit down. I have a lot. Of <laughs> <laughs> that was not my suggestion. I still have a lot of energy. <laughs> I mean, just because I turned 91 doesn't mean <laughs> that I'm giving up on you. No, I know. I'll still be around, Bevan. I know. Thank you. So, colleagues, if I, uh, President Lee. Um, I'll, I'll be brief here. Um, 
you know, a lot of the folks who get written down in the history books are, you know, folks who run for office, who probably have overinflated egos. And we unfortunately remember those memories more than people like you, Laverta, um, who really built BART, you have built our region, um, and not only with a physical um, acts of God, you know, you have uh, worked to, um, you know, manage massive, massive construction projects over your many years in this field, um, but everything you've done to really build the workforce and um, be an amazing champion for the black community. Um, we are so, I, I don't think grateful is even the right word. Um, I'm, I'm just honored to have known you um, and to be able to so deeply appreciate all that you have done for BART, for the Bay Area and beyond. And um, I'm hoping that this resolution today is just our, the, the, the tools that we have here on the BART board to remember your name forever in history with this resolution to say, you did this and we are honored. Seeing, um, seeing no other requests, um, I would say I would like to move um, this matter for approval. I'll second it. Um, Madam District Secretary, if you could. Yes. Vote. Director Simon. Director Allen. Yes. Director Aim. Yes. Director Dufty. Yes. Vice President Foley. Aye. Director McPartland. Aye. Director Rayburn. Yay. Director Saltzman. Yes. President Lee. Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. So we're going to take a moment and come around and take a photograph. And I'd like to invite um, the AGMs that are in the crowd, as well as our general manager and, and uh, we'll come there.
What a special way to begin this meeting. I think we have to ask for any public comment on this item as well. Um, so is there any public comment on this resolution to commend Laverta Allen, the founder of the Allen Group? I got one, President. Okay. Thank you, thank you. I'm so honored to be here today. Um, my name is Fred Jordan. I'm with F.E. Jordan Associates. The Cleveland Transit Authority said that we were the first minority firm in transit in the United States. Uh, I've been with BART for a long time, been around for a long time. That's why I feel qualified to say a few words about Laverne Allen. Uh, we did the coma section. We did the intermodal. We've done many projects. And I have to say, Laverna Allen is probably the most vocal advocate for minority business in the United States. I've worked for the Chicago South, Southwest Transit Authority. I've worked in Los Angeles. I've done some 30 projects throughout the country. I am the peer review for the high-speed rail, and I can speak for Laverna Allen. She has put minority businesses in the forefront. And I just, I came from afar just to say, I am so pleased and thankful uh, for her presence and being here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. George. Um, it looks like we have another public commenter. Please come up and introduce yourself. Good morning, my name is Jesus Vargas, uh, president of Compto Northern California. Here also to honor uh, the, the Allen Group's founder, uh, Laverta Allen. Very excited that she has been, an, and they have been an active member within Compto, supporting our minority uh, youth uh, efforts, our scholarship. Um, that's the hat uh, that I wear with the Compto NorCal. I'll put on my small business hat. There are other small businesses that I feel we feel that they have paved the way for us to do work for BART and other agencies by changing policies, by being able to get more participation. So we're really excited, not just for what they've inspired, but what for BART is doing by taking the advice of people like Laverta Allen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have any other public comment online or in person? No. no. Great. Um, I'm like just so joyful now. Uh, thank you everyone for being here um, for Miss Allen. And hopefully whatever that is, we're gonna be okay. With that, I would now like to move to the consent calendar. Do you approval? know what that is? All right, great. Uh, so sorry, there was a motion to move approval. Second. Great, before we take the vote, I would like to make sure we go to public comment. Um, District Secretary, is there any public comment on this item? Yes, we have one public commenter, Alita Dupree. One okay. moment. Alita? Um, thank you, uh, good morning, uh, President Lee and members. Uh, Alita Dupree for the record, she and her. Um, I'm gonna talk about the consent uh, 5D. Uh, I sent you a, a letter, hopefully you got to read it. Uh, I'm gonna claim some standing to speak on this item uh, because I have spoken on it before. I, I'm in the neutral on this. Uh, as I've said in my letter, I think I'm a little surprised that an item of this would be taken up with consent. So I'm gonna simply state uh, my feelings for the record. Um, I, I do stand by my original uh, support of this item. And so in the neutral, um, you know, I'm, I'm supporting if you decide to repeal it. But what I don't want us to repeal is the mission of ensuring uh, equity and inclusion 
for our employees and contractors of BART because it is still a dangerous world out there. And that unfortunately happens in all 50 states. Um, things happen uh, in states on that formerly prohibitive list and things happen in states that were never on that list. And I do think about my brethren who are in those various states on that uh, formerly prohibited list. And there is a, a lot of talent uh, in those communities as well, that hopefully we can access. And as I said in my letter, my, my travels reflect uh, my values and I have a choice. But employees work under forced dispatch. We should learn uh, about uh, our people who work in industries that travel across state and international lines, such as uh, airline employees and um, truckers going to truck stops and customers uh, to pick up and deliver all around the country. And uh, people, airlines, they even go into uh, other countries. I have a family member who is a uh, airline pilot that flies exclusively international. So in the repeal of this, of this resolution, how can we make sure that we are a BART that still stands for inclusion? Because I don't want anybody to be dispatched into danger. It's one thing to sign an enlistment contract and go to war, but I would not ask that of those who work for BART. Remember, BART is the people's system. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public commenters? No other public commenters. Um, before we go to the vote, I'll just say briefly, um, Alita, I, I really appreciate your comment on this. If I believe that the travel ban um, actually had the impact that our intent had, um, that would be first amazing. And also we would not be looking at the rescinding that policy. Um, and you know, we want to make sure uh, we at BART make policies that have the, in, the outcomes and the impact that our intent um, means for it to have. And so, you know, I think there's more that we certainly can do to be inclusive um, of more folks, LGBTQ folks, um, women, uh, people of color, immigrants, um, limited English proficiency folks, and, and all of the things. Um, so with that, we have a motion and a second, so let's move to the roll call vote. Director Simon. Director Allen. Yes. Director Ames. Yes. Director Dufty. Yes. D Vice President Foley. Aye. Director McPartland. Aye. Director Rayburn. Yay. Director Salzman. Yes. And Vice President Lee. Yes. The motion carries. Excellent. Um, all right, I'll turn it over to you, GM Powers, for our general manager's report. Good morning, President Lee, Board of Directors. Good morning. A couple updates for you to be tracking on, if you will. Uh, so April is Autism Month. And last week we hosted, I was part of it with Alicia and many other people at BART, we hosted more than a dozen families with children that are on the autism spectrum here at BHQ um, in this boardroom and, and at different floor locations here. Uh, the kids recorded special announcements uh, in celebration of Autism Acceptance Month, and these recordings we're going to play at select stations for the rest of the month. So when you're out in the system, you will be hearing these um, announcements. So many of you know the term um, community of metros. It's a group that we're part of. It's called Comet. And BART is, has the privilege of hosting Comet um, starting Tuesday, April 18th through Friday, April 24th. Um, this is worldwide metros uh, coming to San Francisco, and there's going to be um, a discussion and exchange of information, best practices, benchmarking analysis, um, updates from each of the metros, um, you know, New York City Transit, London Underground, um, Seoul will be here, you know, some big, some big systems out there. There'll be some technical site visits. There'll be some net 
networking. Um, it's a very important um, uh, event that Bart will be hosting here. So that's all running through uh, Shane Edwards and his team. Uh, next Thursday, one week from today, is the, um, the grand opening of the Gateway at Millbrae Station. Um, it's going to be, uh, it's an award-winning uh, TOD program. I saw some, some information come, in, come through my LinkedIn just the other day. And so, President Lee, I know you, Director Dufty, Director Simon, Director McPartland, um, will be in attendance there at the grand opening. And the celebration begins at 4 o'clock. That's one week from today down at Millbury. Um, next Friday... Uh, Myself and the my fellow transit GMs, you know, we have this Monday meeting, and and um, but next Friday is our second annual. Uh, it's second annual, I think, right, Alicia? Um, uh, oh, it is says second here, and this is our transit GMs ride along, and it was such a hit. All the GMs got together, and we focused on you know the connections, and we took Bart. Last time we took Bart to Muni to the ferries. This time we're mainly focusing on the East Bay, and we're with Contra Costa and um, and our partner agencies in the East Bay. So it's a week from Friday. It was very well received, um, and we're looking forward to that um, uh, event. And then we end in Walnut Creek at a happy hour. So obviously the public is invited to attend. Many of our public are there talking with me and the other GMs there. It's, it's, it's a good event. Uh, on the operations side, uh, so this weekend is going to be the second weekend, the second of five weekends for the, that we're going to be doing some work on the yellow line. So there'll be a bus bridge between Rock Ridge and Orinda. And Shane and his team are going to be um, replacing and interlocking out there. This is the second weekend of five. Um, there'll be a bus bridge there that's timed into um, to meet both on, on both sides, the Rockridge side and the Orinda side, to connect into the BART system. And um, the next weekend following this one will be uh, May 13th, uh, will be the third weekend there. Uh, the next item I just wanted to make sure you're tracking on if you have an opportunity. Uh, so we're back up and running on the BART Service Awards. These are very important uh, milestones in the careers of our uh, BART family members. And we had to discontinue this event uh, because of the COVID in 2019. What this is, is we go out and we give five year, 10 year, 20 year, 25 year, 35 year. And matter of fact, I gave a 46 year pin out just the other day. And so we're back up and running on these events. We've already done, I think four of them, two at um, BPD headquarters, two out at, at, the, at Richmond Yard. And so these will be at the yards, the shops, the next one happens to be tomorrow, right across the street here over at Caltrans Auditorium. And there are so many people receiving their pins that we needed to break it up into two sessions there. And it starts at one o'clock and it's well received. I kind of give a, you know some of the areas that we're focusing on. I try to open it up to questions and then we present the, the, their awards and it's very well received. And um, anyway, it's a, it's a good thing. And if you're around, I'm happy to see you in the audience there. You heard a little bit about um, from Shotzi about an internship program. Well, our workforce development team, which is fully staffed right now, has launched the 2023 uh, BART Summer Internship Program. And that program is with our community-based organizations, the edu educational institutions, um, and uh, the workforce development boards. It's a six-week paid internship program that runs from um, towards the end of June through the first week in August. And it's for students focusing really on high school, junior college, and college level. And so um, that's our workforce development team headed by uh, Mr. Alaric de Graffenried. So a little bit on ridership. So for the month of March, the whole month of March, we were relatively flat and held at 39% for the whole month of March. Um, and uh, weekday ridership was, you know, at around 37%, and weekend ridership was a little bit higher, um, and so it averaged for 39%. Um, 
we're a little optimistic, you know, with the weather changing here and, you know, people out and about, you know, on the nights and the weekends, we're going to keep our eye on that. And I know Pam, the head of budgets, performance and budgets, provides an update on that. And we'll certainly, it'll be in every one of my GM's reports. So we're keeping our eye on ridership. So President Lee, members of the board, happy to take questions. Great. Let's uh, go to public comment first. Yes, ma'am. We do have two hands raised. One moment. Alita Dupree. All right. Uh, uh, thank you. Hope you can hear me. Appreciate yes. it. Uh, President Janice Lee and members. Alita Dupree, for the record, my pronouns are she and her. Um, very, very good report. I have heard about the various announcements uh, that are being made on BART, and I think I also read that they are doing uh, the announcements uh, prepared by people with autism in New York City. And this, this is very good work because uh, diverse voices uh, need to be heard. I've known a few people with autism uh, in my life. And so hopefully we can really get the word out. We should have some kind of website where people who aren't in the system can pull up um, recordings of these announcements so, so we can get some uh, inspiration. Uh, that, that, that's very, very important inclusive work. It, it, it needs to continue. Um, ridership, hopefully it does come up. I, I was on the system uh, several times uh, recently and uh, trying to find out about New York, I think they're around 70%. So we have to ask ourselves, what, what can we do to, to get uh, closer to that? And this um, meeting with other transit systems, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing about that. The fact that BART is included uh, with large systems such as uh, New York and London, not just large systems, but systems that hold to ideals that are legendary and stately, uh, it's, it's a, something to be very proud of that art can be included uh, in uh, that group. And uh, we can't forget about our operations, of course, and uh, navigating with the, um, the work that we're doing out on the line recently with the, uh, between Orinda and Rock Ridge. Uh, so, so overall, the, this is a, a good report uh, to hear about the things that we're doing that exemplify the ideal that part is the people system. Thank you. We do have another speaker. I'm not sure if it's for this item. Ackman, would you like to speak on the general manager's report? Okay. Um, seeing no other public comment, um, I'll open up for my board colleagues if you have any questions or comments um, in response to GM Powers' report. Should we talk to the chief? No. No. Okay. Fine. No. Good. All right. Well, make it easy on you. <laughs> um, uh, I, I guess that's it for this item then. Um, so now we will move on to general public comment item seven. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address the board of directors on matters under our jurisdiction, but not on the agenda. Um, you'll have three minutes for your comment. Um, so district secretary, do we have any in-person or online public comment? We do have an in-person public commenter, um, Glenn Overton. Uh, Glenn, would you like to come up to the podium? Thank you so much. Glenn, for joining us again here today. Um, please go ahead. You have three minutes. Yeah, I've uh, <clears throat> been operating trains uh, for since I was four years old. Uh, 
Having said that, uh, I've also operated the uh, 23 line, the tr streetcar line, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which at the time was a, the world's longest streetcar line. Having said that, you get very intimate with the equipment, with street traffic, with passengers, and management. And then now, having said that, I would say that even though I was intimate with that equipment, street traffic and passengers, looking back, I can say that I dehumanized the passengers. I tuned them out. Now, having said that, I shouldn't be so redundant, but, you know, I believe that your BART operators are very lonely people. He has no contact with passengers, no contact with street, path, street, car, uh, street traffic, and he's a captive for whatever time he's in that cabin. And you should understand that, that he's going to dehumanize us as passengers because he has absolutely no contact unless you educate him or provide him with some means of coming into knowledge of what that is to be a passenger. And that's your responsibility as management. I, I think that it's a very lonely job. It takes a special person to be captive in that cabin for whatever shift time that is. And you have to give those people credit for the job that they do. And I do. Because I don't think they ever would have had the experience that I have had with just street traffic, cars that come screeching to a halt right in front of a vehicle that has a stopping distance. And so that's what I wanted to say. I think that we should honor our, our operators for having to endure. And there's a latency to that dehumanization. No matter how much you tell them, they're going to dehumanize. And you have a good day. Thank you, Glenn, for taking the time to share your thoughts with the board here today. District Secretary, are there any online public comments? Yes, we have two more public commenters. Fran Quittle, this is public comment time. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. My name is Fran Quittel. I live in Emeryville. I actually serve on the Budget Advisory Committee in our city. Um, I want to say good morning to the BART board and to the staff. Um, BART is essential to the economic and cultural health of the Bay Area, and I fully support your efforts to get riders back on BART. However, my recent experience needs to be heard because it is a common experience. I try to use BART when I can, and it is difficult. There are many deranged homeless people in the cars. There are smokers on the, plant, on the platform and in transit cars running up and down. There are gym exhibitionists using hand straps for contortions while the train is moving, seeking money. One train I was on had excrement on the car floor. I used my BART card to exit at, West, at Oakland West, a non-paying rider closed up on me, so both of us exited on my exit card swipe. But the parking lot was dark that night, and I got in touch with Alicia Trust because the parking lot was pitch dark, and there were two police cars there, a station agent, and she said that she investigated this, thankfully, and there was an electrical short. Now, I believe firmly in a mass transit system and a system that has riders. What I am proposing to you is that you have a station that gives out, this may sound ridiculous, 
sandwiches and drinks to people who need food so that there's a center for them to go rather than have people on every station who need money, who need food, who need care. And I also feel this issue of the dark parking lot, the pitch dark parking lot with the police cars sitting there and the station agent who was oblivious to this, your people, whatever color or age they may be, need better training. That's my comment. You're welcome to be in touch with me. I want ridership on BART and I want safe ridership. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Um, if there's a way to be able to get that public commenter's information, um, yeah, uh, it looks like Alicia Ray has uh, your information. So we'll make sure that we maybe perhaps Shane Edwards, our AGM of operations can follow up. Um, we appreciate you taking the time to share your thoughts. Uh, next public commenter. Next speaker, Alita Dupree. Uh, th th thanks again, uh, President Janice Lee and members. Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her, uh, as I broadcast to you from my uh, solar powered world headquarters. Uh, hopefully I'll be in person with you soon. Uh, th thank you for making the Pledge of Allegiance audible. It's good to be able to participate with you. A bit of housekeeping. I sent a message on 26 March entitled Comments from Above, and it has not been placed in the meeting details and public comment file for this meeting. I sent a reminder about it yesterday, so that needs to be updated. Yes, I did write the letter off in part on an airplane in turbulence and mentioned lots of things and put some, put, uh, uh, put a photograph in it. So uh, I ask that you update public comment to include that material because that is intended uh, as public record. Um, I mentioned uh, on one of my recent trips that I got to meet up with a member of the Bart family uh, who I will not name. And uh, uh, there are several of us walking along uh, after a meeting. And this person asked, so are you going to head back to your place? I said, yeah, I guess I'll get the bus. And this very nice individual said to me, well, well why don't you ride on, on BART with us? I said, OK, all right. And as we were talking, I shared about my uh, 53 years of New York City subway riding. and. I said, you know, you can never have enough Grand Central Terminal. And this person said to me, uh, you, you can never have enough BART. And so I, I thought about that for a bit. And we went on our ride and it was very enjoyable. And I knew uh, there, I felt the inclusion that came from our little group, about four of us that were riding BART together and it was noisy. Uh, but, but I really get, did get to experience the, the fullness of BART. And uh, how, how do we build the best BART? How do we be met meticulous uh, with things? And I'm always learning new things about BART and sending messages to the uh, district secretary uh, because uh, I do believe that answers await those who ask questions. Um, but I did get to ride on some new trains and hopefully we'll have more new trains uh, uh, because then uh, they're, they're quieter, easier on my ears. And, um, I have... Uh, tinnitus and, uh, that goes back for, for many years, probably goes back to me being in the service. And so uh, uh, sometimes I still have to put my earplugs on. But I thought about the, 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 the question posed to me by this member of your Bark family saying, you can never ha have enough Bark. Well, there are many answers and wisdom comes with time. But an answer did come to me of what did that mean? And the answer is, Bart is the people system. Thank you. Thank you, Alita. Um, do we have any other public comment? No other f public comment at this time. All right, we'll close public comment. I want to give a shout out to Travis for helping with the operations of the meeting today. Um, we are going to actually skip our budget item for now and return to it. Um, and instead, we will first go to engineering and operations items. So I will pass the gavel over to VP Foley. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, colleagues, we have three items before us today for our action. Uh, an update on fare gates, uh, surveillance technology approval, 
and an award of a contract regarding improvement program for accessibility. What I'd like to do is take items B and C up front, and unless there's opposition, I will entertain a motion for those two items together. Move approval. So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Are there any public comment items on items B, which is surveillance technology approval, or item C, which is the Accessibility Improvement Program Phase Two contract. Yes, I have one public commenter via Zoom. Okay, thank you. Alita, you may go. Um, th th thanks again, uh, Committee Chair Mark Foley. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her. Uh, we're moving pretty quickly, but I did get to read through uh, some of this um, material and. Uh, I think it, it merits approval um, because um, it's important that uh, we are able to measure and evaluate. And it looks to me from this little four, six page presentation that we're doing so in a uh, reasonable way. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm fine with this. And whenever I read about accessibility, uh, is um, very, very important. Um, I, I want more accessibility for all of us. I'm seeing uh, it's about ADA, uh, improving our uh, ADA. And uh, ADA can always be improved uh, because I, I'm a person with, with disabilities. And uh, most of my ADA advocacy is in trying to get uh, 300 subway stations in the 300 stations in the New York City subway made accessible. So uh, this is an investment uh, in accessibility uh, because of the disability community is, is, is very diverse. And I live with uh, profound disabilities and it's both about building new things and keeping what's already in place uh, operable. So anyway, that's my quick, um, uh, update on this. We're moving pretty fast. I'll say more about Fair Gates later. Always remember that uh, all these things emphasize the values. I hope you share with me that BART is the people system. Thank you. Thank you, Alita. And yes, I do indeed agree that BART is the people system. Um, Madam Secretary, do we have any additional public comment? No additional public commenters at this time. All right. Um, if you would uh, turn to the vote for us, I'd appreciate it. Um, oh, so I apologize. Do we have any director's comments on B and C? Thank you. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so I guess I'll Sorry, go. Director Allen. <laughs> Thank you. I, I do have a, a, a couple of comments about this item. Um, and sorry, I'm trying to pull it up. Um, so the first, the first comment is on uh, page six of the policy section. Um, it's section I, I believe, auditing and oversight. Um, this this provision is not acceptable to me, and so uh, if if I was to vote on yes on this policy, I would want to um, amend uh, or at least direct staff to amend this. And here's why. In section C of the policy, the senior manager of social services partnership is identified as the quote system owner of this technology, okay? And quote, one or more members of the office of CIO are assigned to assist him. <clears throat> In section I, under auditing and oversight, the senior manager of so social services partnership is stated as the auditor in, co quote, coordination with the office of the CIO. So what you have here is the auditors and the auditees are one and the same. They are the same people. Um, this is not even a fox watching a hen house. It is the fox watching the fox. <laughs> and so um, I, I would request that there be an amendment to that section to uh, have the Office of Independent Police Auditor be take the the lead be the lead person as the auditor of this program so um and then i i do have some some struggles Recording with the first sentence, sentence. Mm -hmm. Hello. 
Should I continue? Sorry okay. about that. We, we're reloading a Zoom, so sorry about that. Okay. Um, so uh, I do have some struggles with the first sentence in the motion uh, that, that says um, that this board has uh, determined, I'm sorry, I'm trying to pull that up. It says that w this board has determined that the uh, benefits outweigh the costs of this program. I think when we're embarking on something new, I don't think we, that I could actually say that the benefits of this technology outweigh the costs when we haven't even implemented it and tried it out. So I do object to that part of the motion and I would ask the, uh, for a friendly amendment to have that first sentence stricken from the motion. I'll so. second that. If I may interrupt, or not interrupt, but respond to that. Um, maybe what this board needs is more information, but one of the requirements of the surveillance ordinance is that the board make that finding. Make, make the finding? That yes. That's in the surveillance ordinance that was passed. I'll get the year wrong, but in 2018 or so. That is a requirement. Um, so if, the, if this board doesn't have enough information to make that finding, then maybe you need more information. But amending the motion to delete that sentence um, makes this according to board policy means this policy cannot go into effect. I'd, I'd like to respond on behalf of the general manager's office, if, uh, Chair Foley, if you'll allow, uh, Director Allen. So one, happy to have the independent auditor, uh, happy to make the amendment to that policy, either the independent police auditor or internal audit, since independent police auditor is independent, I don't want to steer work their way, but either way, happy with that. Uh, and then secondly, the cost of the uh, application that we're purchasing is under the general manager's authority, so it's less than $99,000. And the benefit will be that we'll be able to provide, on a quarterly basis, updates on the Progressive Policing Bureau. So we believe that it does meet that criteria, the performance metrics. Okay, so I, I um, actually, I'm in favor of the technology, and I think it's a good thing, but I just don't think we've been presented with anything that's, that that says to us that the costs outweigh the the benefit. I mean, the benefits outweigh the costs. Um, but okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna let that go. Okay, I, I one, one other thing. You, we do that every year. We bring back the annual surveillance policy, and then you can you know you will be able to see the outputs over the next four quarters. And when we vote on the uh, surveillance policy usage next year, July, you can make the determination that it doesn't. Okay, fair enough. So so. Uh, that amendment to the motion, I, I'm, I'm fine with supporting the motion, but I want to go back to the auditor. You mentioned the Office of Independent Police Auditor or internal audit. Internal audit would not be independent in this case because both uh, items are managed within the general manager's purview. So it would only be the Office of Independent Police Auditor or the IG's office, which would be truly an independent audit of this program. I prefer to see the Office of Independent Police Auditor uh, take jurisdiction over this because they are, you know, they work with the police programs. So if you're, if someone's willing to add that to the motion uh, as a as an amendment that the policy be amended at a future date, um, can we do that, Matt? Staff's happy with that. <laughs> yes. Um, with, yes, but what I would say is we are required to publish this policy 15 days before the board adopts it. This is a non-substantive change, so I would be comfortable with it. Um, I would suggest if our um, independent police auditor is in the audience that you ask him if this is something he's willing to take on. Is Mr. Bloom in the house? I did see him. I know, I know he's around. He may have stepped out to the restroom or something, but I know he's around. Okay, so I'm asking the maker of the motion to amend to get direct staff to uh, change this last provision at a future meeting. Yeah, I, I believe it was properly moved as a as an amendment. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're I, believe, I believe. All right. I, I believe uh, Director McPartland accepted the second. Is that correct? Sir, you make. I thought it. You, you just want to change the motion, right? You're not trying. And I'm okay with accepting okay. it if staff's okay. Got it. I don't know who seconded, but they also need to be okay. Coming down right now. All right. All right. So um, we have a friendly amendment that has been accepted by the maker of the motion. Is the seconder of the motion accept that amendment? And I believe that was Director McPartland.
That's that's correct. I did second it, but uh, based on uh, staff's uh, uh, response to that, that uh, you'll be able to make those corrections. Uh, uh, I, in that case, uh, for the uh, expediting the process, uh, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, remove my second. No, we need your second, it's, Director. It's, I'm well, sorry. Well, someone else so, can second it. So maybe we could just have so, a description of, of the, the final language for everybody's benefit. And I think John would be comfortable, right. hopefully. So to clarify, I think there is a friendly amendment to include language to have the OIPA act as an auditor of this Correct. particular policy. And I think we're waiting for Mr. Bloom, and, who has and, arrived. Uh, impeccable timing. Um, Russell, if you have not heard, we're discussing the surveillance technology um, policy, and uh, there's been a friendly amendment to ask your office to to be, an, I guess, an auditor, if you will, uh, of this. Uh, is that some work that you feel you can take ownership of? I, I certainly uh, would need to understand a little bit more about what the resources would be required to do that work in order to... Um, commit to that. Um, I would be reluctant to commit to that here without further examining what it would require. Uh, it certainly seems appropriate for that to be in my wheelhouse. <laughs> Excuse me for being out of breath. I took the stairs. <laughs> um, but um, I would like to incorporate that into my work plan. Um, is it possible for me to circle back um, or accept the work? with uh, a commitment to look more deeply into what I might need in terms of additional resources to do it properly. Understood, let me turn to Director Saltzman. I, I just, I guess I wanna see, I wanna see from staff, does it make sense to try to move forward with this today in the original motion and then come back and, and see if Russell and his office can do this, or should we delay two weeks? Is that going to have an impact on this? Seems like we need more time to figure this out some way or another. So I, I guess, uh, uh, Director Saltzman, you know, we made a commitment that we would have data for progressive policing stats in the next QPR, and, and I'm ready to push the button on the software purchase tomorrow if we can get this approved. So you know, just know that if it doesn't get approved and if it sits on the shelf for a couple yep. of weeks, that's going to delay that. But other than that, staff's... So, so I guess what I would ask is to not include this in the language of the motion, but to instead, you know, put some language saying we'll come back to discuss who would do the auditing because we could still move forward at that point. Is, is that okay with you, Director Allen, to make sure that, you know, the OIPA's office is actually able to do this before we say they're going to do it? Well, I think this really comes, you know, what are... Uh, what Mr. Bloom is talking about is resources, and if it turns out that more resources are needed, then, then we address more resources. Um, but the function of the auditor cannot be the people who are being audited, and so the policy itself is written wrong. I won't be supporting the motion to pass this policy as is. Okay, well, I'd, I'd still like to move forward with the motion without, without changing who's auditing it, but come back in sometime in the next two meetings to discuss if it makes sense and if there's capacity for the OIP to do it. So that is my amended second. motion. I second the substitute. Director Simon. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you so much, Chair, for recognizing me. Um, I, I do think that there is an opportunity, again, and I think it's hard to word Smith in the moment, um, but if the general manager's office is uh, committed to ensuring that Russell's office um, either has the people and or staff, and in the next couple of weeks, if we approve today, but that pending, pending an MOU, whatever it is, um, if, if Russell, again, I, I don't, this isn't the wrong place to figure this out, I think, in the moment, but the, the duty of your office, you, you, I believe you do agree um, that it would make sense um, to oversee um, and to audit uh, these processes. So if there is agreement on that, I think that the question is, of course, it's, it's the how. Um, is there a way that we can move today with the knowledge that your office is definitely in need to determine what, what those functionalities are and to be able to get the information and support back from the general manager's office so we can move? Is, is, can there be a yes and 
is my, I guess, my question, Chair. Sure, I think the motion could be approved, you know, if available resources or some other language to be included. But Russell, did you have feedback on that? My only feedback, and just so that I'm clear, is I agree that anything related to policing and police practices and processes and procedures is appropriate for me to audit. Um, what I am reluctant to do is agree to do something here in this context that I haven't had a previous conversation about with anybody in this room. So I just want to take a pause, make sure that I'm fully understanding the context and what's expected. Uh, and once I've had that conversation, then make a commitment. Um, whatever that looks like and however we need to make sure we've had that conversation, I'm absolutely ready to do that. Um, and uh, as I've said, I agree that it sounds like it's an appropriate scope of work for me. So right. it sounds like a yes and from me. So Und Chair, under Chair Foley, I'm yes. sorry, just one other thing to jump in to offer to maybe try to move this item along and support Director Saltzman and, and maybe Director Allen. There's, Travis is here, his team is gonna be implementing the software. There's a three to four month, from what I'm understanding, implementation period of the software. So there's plenty of time for us to figure out what the audit requirements is, the time commitments involved, and if you know if it exceeds the IPA's uh, uh, time, then we can come back and do something different. But you have our commitment that we'll bring it back within before we implement and determine who's going to audit the program. So maybe Director Allen can support that. Thank you for that. Um, I see three directors are in the queue. Um, if you have items to add that'll help move this forward, I would appreciate it. Uh, Director Ames, Dufty, and Simon. Well, I, I appreciate this amendment, and I, I would hope that we could come up with the staff to support the police auditing function, um, because we had a cost involved to do the auditing to begin with. I guess this is mainly a staff cost. Uh, maybe somebody from staff can support the police auditor. Um, I just don't see this as a, a huge hurdle to overcome and we have resources. We were going to do it internally and now we're shifting it over to the police auditor. So why couldn't we just easily provide this resource since we already had this resource to begin with? I really hope this doesn't delay this much further. I'm really frustrated by this that we probably know the cost, we know the staffing, and maybe there's a way to the two, for the two departments to work together, but, okay. Thank you, Director Dufty. Thank you. I do believe that the substitute motion on the floor addresses this in, I think, the most reasonable way possible, as, as uh, Director Saltzman has pointed out, that there you know, is an opportunity to consult and come back in the next couple of meetings, but yet and still to move forward with the elements uh, in terms of getting the software and moving forward. So colleagues, I, I do believe that the substitute motion really takes us in, in, in the right direction and it gives the opportunity for com consultation and all of, all of the good things that we might need. So I, I encourage um, my colleagues to support the substitute. Can I ask that the substitute motion be, uh, be stated? I'm not really sure what it is now. I don't know that. Matt will have to tell me if it's a substitute. I think I was going back to sort of the first motion, but changing it, whether it's a substitute or not, since I made the original motion. I, but the motion is that it's, it's to move forward with this item and come back in the next month to determine who would audit it once, you know, the OIPA and staff have talked and, and figured this out. So is I said no, no. That's a different Sorry. motion. I, I don't want to <clears throat> jump in here, but if the if the question is out there, is this a substitute motion or an original motion? As Director McPartland withdrew his second, okay. there is no longer another motion on the floor. So there is only one motion at this point on the floor, is my understanding, because I didn't hear a second after Director McPartland withdrew his second. So procedurally, the original motion is on the floor, correct? Procedurally, Director Saltzman motion. Director Saltzman's motion is on the floor with a second from Director Dufty. Got it. All right. Okay. And the and the language of that motion is? It's it's what's in the EDD except to add. It's what's in the EDD except to add that we will come back in sometime in the next couple of meetings. I said a month, but now I realize I don't know if our next 
four week meeting is a month out or more, but within the next two meetings and decide who's gonna do the auditing after the OIPA and staff have discussed this and determined. All right, uh, Director Allen. Yeah, I, I wanted that clarity, and I, I'm I'm fine with that motion as long as there is clarity that there's a time frame and that staff will come back and we address this auditing issue. Thank you. Got it. All right, so let's go to a combined vote. I believe we are still on items B and C. Um, if that is correct, let's go to the vote, Madam Secretary. Yes. Director Simon. Yes. Director Allen. Yes. Director Ames. Yes. Director Dufty. Yes. Vice President Foley. Aye. Director McPartland. Aye. Director Rayburn. Yay. Director Salzman. Yes. And President Lee. Yes. The motion carries. Thank you, Madam Secretary, and thank you, colleagues, for working through that sausage-making uh, example here. Um, having done that, let us turn our attention back to item A, which is regarding the new Fairgate uh, equipment by competitive negotiation, and I will turn it over to staff for a very anticipated presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Foley. Thank you, Board. Shane Edwards, AGM of Operations. Uh, on this item, it is to uh, ask for the award of a contract for the procurement of Fairgates, and I would like to introduce to you Sylvia Lamb, AGM of Infrastructure Delivery and Group Manager, Wendy Wheeler of Systems and Data Analytics Engineering. Good morning, directors. I'm very thrilled. We, our presentation, I guess, is a little big. Next slide. Got it? Okay. Uh, as we discussed at the last board meeting, uh, that was the first step in the process and we promised we would come back at this board meeting and provide more information, uh, more details, and then also ask for award of the Fairgate project. So the vendor selection process, as you may remember, I'm sure you do, <laughs> June 2020 is when we came to the board with what we considered an actionable plan to move forward and get new fare gates in this system. Uh, remember before that, the price tag was pretty high and we had come up with a way that we could get that price tag down and we could move forward with a hybrid approach. So we would do some internal work and we would also go out in the industry, in the world, to see what was available. So we uh, submitted uh, RFEI, a request for expression of interest, and we got a lot of feedback across the world on fair gates and those possibilities, which made it very enticing and very plausible to do this. So we came back to the board with a request to do a different procurement and to make it a um, basically a best value procurement, but I think we call it a competitive negotiation. And that was approved last year in January. And since then, we've been working through uh, getting proposals, evaluating proposals. We did have a hiccup and went back onto the street, and, uh, and now we're back today to ask for approval to move forward. The competitive negotiation process allows us to evaluate the gates on uh, different criteria. And we had a nine person panel committee uh, that was from uh, different uh, departments at BART that were part of this panel and evaluated each of the proposals as they came in. The first piece was the technical approach. Uh, I also want to point out that in the instructions to proposers, this was laid out in the instructions so the proposers knew what criteria they would be evaluated on as they came about. So the first thing we did was look at the technical approach and score those approaches individually as panels. Uh, then we moved on to qualifications of the firm and the proposers team. We evaluated that and then submitted also our scores with uh, those pieces of work. After both of those pieces were done and the uh, proposers were deemed um, that they were appropriate to move forward, only then were the price proposals open. The price proposal was basically simple math. If you were the lowest score, you got the highest points, 20 points, and all the other proposers were given a proportion of that based on a formula on how it relative to the lowest score. 
the last piece were oral interviews, and I think I said this last time, I found that to be the most fascinating piece. The first part was a presentation by the vendor along with a demo. Uh, the, the vendor that we're going to recommend today uh, demonstrated via Zoom, it wasn't a video that was given to us via Zoom, so we had some interaction there on how the fair gates would do against not allowing crawl under, not allowing crawl over or jump over. <laughs> and also, um, they did a very good demonstration on how it would resist uh, push through based on the criteria we had in the technical proposal. Um, and then the next part of the uh, uh, oral interview were five questions. And again, the proposers were given those five questions ahead of time so that they were prepared when they came in to discuss that. Uh, as we said last time, uh, S traffic was successful. Each of those categories that we reviewed were tallied and an average score put for each one. So you can see under technical approach each uh, proposer score. And then there was a grand total. And from that grand total, uh, there was a ranking where S traffic was uh, the highest ranking proposer. From that, I'm going to turn it over to Wendy to talk about S traffic a little bit more in their qualifications. Thank you, Sylvia. During the S traffic technical proposal, the vendor met our technical specifications. Their open architecture, experience with Clipper TR4 reader, integration, modular design, and readily available industrial components will enable BART to enhance functionality, maintain, and upgrade parts in the gates. S traffic has done design build, construction, installation, and system integration of fare gates in a variety of transit agencies. S-Traffic describes the approximately 16,000 gates installed around the world. Keep in mind, all the gates are different. For instance, they designed a swing gate in Korea, and in WMATA, they were tasked to install a Kalam style gate. WMATA's gates were placed in revenue service on schedule according to the integrated deployment plan. S Traffic's three DBE firms are E Squared Engineering, FST Engineering, which is a local Bay Area business, and Pride Resource Partners. We would like to thank the extensive team from S Traffic and the DBE and diversity team for being in the boardroom today. The DBE goals for the Fairgate RFP was 4%, and S Traffic proposed DBE participation of 11.3% of which 8.3% will be local. The higher DBA goal shows S Traffic's commitment to promoting diversity, equality, economic growth, competition, and innovation in the Fairgate project. Prior to submitting their proposal, S Traffic did a lot of outreach to local Bay Area community groups. As a result, S Traffic has committed to provide 2,000 hours of new technical internships to Bay Area community based organizations, hand on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics internships provide students with the opportunity to apply theoretical knowledge gained in the classroom to real world projects. This hand on experience allows them to keep develop keep to develop practical skills and deeper understanding of how technical concepts are applied. It also gives them the opportunity to work with cutting edge technology, tools and equipment, which they will be valuable in their future careers. During previous Fairgate projects, S Traffic worked extensively with the ADA community. They learned a lot from these sessions. For example, what kind of lighting and color choices like bezels around screens aid the visually impaired. They also refine their sensor technology to handle people with service dogs. S Traffic has incorporated those lessons learned into the Bates, BART's new gates. They are also looking forward to building relationships with the Bay Area ADA community and BART's Accessibility Task Force. This is the conceptual design. The Clipper TR4 reader housing is integrated into the design and BART could install up to six readers per gate. I've worked at the fair gates during the Warriors and Pride parades, <clears throat> sorry, and the biggest pain point was patrons not being able to find readers on the ADA gates. Adding a second reader to the ADA group would help speed up passenger movement for both large events and patrons with luggage and bikes. The gate graphics are easy to understand 
and users will be able to quickly perform tasks without confusion or frustration. Audio alarms are also designed into the gates to meet ADA requirements. Message content design and color can be configured to BART's preferences and best practices. The tall swing gate design provides a barrier at entry point to prevent and deter unauthorized access. The gates have sophisticated sensors which detect and respond to fare evasion. There are visible and audio reminders for passengers to pay their fares, and the monitoring systems have advanced reporting functionality to respond to both maintenance issues and fare evasion. Artificial intelligent technology evaluates and stores patterns that allows for review and analysis. The sensors can detect dogs, bicycles, and luggage, and the system is smart enough to close the gate after these types of items have cleared. No gate can stop piggybacking, but as traffic provides real-time local fare evasion alerts and centralized reporting. The reporting functionality will show the time and exact stations where fare evasion is occurring. The system complies with BART's surveillance ordinance, so no clear facial recognition <clears throat> are captured for analysis. The unique fare gate design is the vendor's concept for BART input. The space between the paddles and gate structure is minimized to prevent crawl under, climb over, and pass throughs. Alarms will sound if piggybacking or climb overs are attempted, and the system logs all fare evasion activity. S traffic monitoring system has superior operations and maintenance user interface, which provides equipment status and control capabilities. The system also provides system performance dashboards and extensive reporting functionality that BART will be able to customize and use from anywhere in the district. The graphical user interface provides point and click real-time control of fare gates. The plug and play uh, replacement and modular design reduces maintenance time to less than 15 minutes. Maintenance technicians and station agents can perform remote diagnostics. If the part is detected, um, failure is detected, the technician will know exactly what part to bring to the field to resolve the problem. S traffic's simple to maintain design requires no tools for board or cable replacements, and all other gate components can be removed from the gate with only a few tools. The simple design and easy to use advanced technolo technology diagnostic tools will also make it easier to train new maintenance staff and station agents. In addition to the sophisticated and easy to monitor system, S traffic is providing a lab test bench for maintenance and engineering. This will enable us to test parts prior to field dispatches and analyze failed parts when they come back to the shop. If we upgrade parts in the future, the test bench will help with quality assurance and interoperability testing. The bench can also be used for staff training. The modular design is simple to assemble and deassemble and is completely scalable. If we add gates to a station, the entire overhead bridge will not, be, will not need to be replaced because the design allows for a new gate to be added with a few screws. The overhead bridge can also easily be taken down if needed for station repairs. And back to me. <laughs> All right, so uh, there was questions about why we chose West Oakland for the pilot, so I wanted to address that. First, there's a single array there, so we'll be e able to instantly tell how effective these gates are from the day before they went in to the day that they do go in. Also, it's geographically close to our maintenance and engineering staff, so that's going to help us with troubleshooting and rollout. And uh, it's about an investment also in the West Oakland area. But the fun part now, schedule, which everybody also wants to know about, we're hoping today that the board approves the general manager uh, to award this contract, after which we'll put out a notice to proceed and start developing a total uh, system-wide deployment plan. Our deployment strategy is, is shoulder to shoulder. We, we want BART staff working with the vendor to roll these out, to modify designs if we need to, and to get this into the system. So because of that, we're also going to pursue separate agreements for installation and infrastructure 
modifications in our stations. Um, the, in the first seven months, that's when the pilot will be uh, deployed in West Oakland. But during that time also, there'll be a training plan and uh, maintenance staff will be trained. Um, after the pilot's out, then we're gonna get the rest of the base contract stations, the gates. Uh, at that point, we're gonna look at the deployment plan for the rest of the gates. At that point, we should have a better understanding of what it's gonna take. Are there any hiccups? Uh, what do we need to look forward to? But again, our deployment strategy is the same as we've been doing from the beginning. Shoulder to shoulder, making sure the BART engineering and maintenance staff are working with the vendor to get the right gates installed that are doing what we want them to do. So with that, um, we're here to ask for board authorization to the general manager to award this contract to S Traffic. The um, alternative would be to reject all bids and go back out on the street. And I just want to let you know that if we went back out on the street, especially if we have to change the procurement or do any kind of repackaging for how we're approaching this, we're looking at a 15 to 18 month delay to getting the gates out there. So uh, with that, I still want to ask for board approval to authorize a general manager to award this contract. And then the last thing I'd like to do is thank all the BART people and, and the board of directors who have been sometimes physically involved with helping us test these fair gates. Uh, but these are all the BART people that have been working with us shoulder to shoulder to make this happen today. So I wanna thank them. Many of them are in the boardroom today. Sorry, I didn't put Michael Jones on there either. Uh, but many of our staff are in the boardroom today because this is a very momentous and exciting time and we're very happy and proud to be here. And so with that, I will answer questions and turn it back to you. I'll move to approve. Second. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, we have a movement and a second on this. But before we jump ahead to a vote, let's first thank you, Sylvia. Thank you to you and your team for bringing this to us and for, you know, trying to meet all of these various different priorities that we've put in front of you. So we truly appreciate that. Um, Madam Secretary, it looks like we have some public comment. Yes. Alita Dupree. Um, thanks again, uh, Chair Mark Foley. Uh, Alita Dupree for the record, she and her. Uh, I'm going to talk about fair gates. Very, very important. I've been waiting for this. Um, I'm going to claim standing because even though I am not a expert on fair gates, I I believe my first Fairgate experience was at the 34th Street and 8th Avenue station in New York City in 1970. This is not new to me. Uh, I'm liking the features that we're putting in with these uh, Fairgates and leveraging uh, what I see to be proven technologies um, that can help to uh, look at situations such as people carrying luggage and packages and uh, use of uh, wheelchairs, uh, et cetera, because we don't want the gates uh, to close on people. Uh, these, the gates we have now, they're, they're showing their age. I'm worried about them not opening correctly or closing on me. And, um, it, it's about time. It looks to me like these are electric fair gates, which seems to be a, a simpler technology. Um, time to move away from the old ways. And one thing that I still don't hear much uh, I'm liking the idea of six readers uh, that are going to be used possibly on these uh, because it is hard to find uh, the, um, the reader that's kind of hidden on the side of the ADA gate. So uh, we want to have several options for those who need to use the ADA gates. Uh, we are going to have to sunset the paper ticketing. I know some people don't want to hear it, and I know some people don't have the stomach for it, uh, but it's time. Uh, we can't do it today, but it's time uh, because uh, trying to keep that going is going to continue to cost us more money. And I don't think, I think we're at the point where the surcharges are not covering the incremental costs of trying to maintain a paper, paper ticketing system across 50 stations. So uh, we, we've got to have the stomach to move forward with this before we put the new fair gates in. So our new fair gates uh, can be forward compatible with the clipper. Because uh, I want to see us go 100% clipper, but I also want to see us, and 
I know uh, a, a, one of you has mentioned this, uh, being able to implement an open payment system, uh, which I would be fine with doing open payments as a BART only uh, standalone system uh, if we can do it quickly because we want to make things more accessible. Uh, I want our new fair gate program to be uh, successful. And I use West Oakland. So thank you for making that the first station. This is another idea that when executed properly can reflect the idea that part is the people system. Thank you. thank you, Madam Secretary. Yes, we have another public speaker, Frank Harrison. You may speak. Uh, thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Frank Harrison. I'm Vice President and General Manager of Conduit Transportation. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak today about the Bar Farragate project. Obviously, we're disappointed we didn't receive the staff's recommendation for this really important work. We worked very hard to present a strong proposal incorporating local businesses and local manufacturing resources. We actually submitted a letter for board's consideration that raises uh, some issues with the staff's findings and recommendations. And I'm hopeful that you will eventually examine those carefully. But most importantly, our letter proposes a solution. I hope the board will seriously consider a multi-vendor pilot rather than just a single pilot with less traffic. Diagrams and artist renderings, which you've seen, are no substitute for actual demonstration of how these gates operate and prevent fare evasion. Unfortunately, the procurement didn't offer an opportunity for the board and staff to see and interact in person with the actual gate solutions being proposed. Conduit's fair gate solution isn't a prototype or artist drawings. It's a proven solution that has been deployed successfully in large cities. It effectively prevents fare evasion without sacrificing ease of use, accessibility, and accessibility for all riders. But you know, take my word for it, that multi-vendor pallet I refer to is a very logical approach to identifying the best fare gate solution uh, for BART and its constituents. Importantly, this can be done at no extra cost and without delaying the timeline the board set, if done and simultaneously. This project is not only important to us at Conduit, it's important to organizations we plan to partner with to deliver the best solution for BART, while also leveraging Bay Area manufacturers and business resources. Our approach would create local supply chain and fuel local economic development. We've, we, have decades, we have decades of experience working with Bay Area partners that successfully deliver on local transportation projects. By the numbers, here's what that equates to. Over 200 is the number of local employees we have in the Bay Area, with offices in Oakland and San Francisco. Over 31% is the share of our solution that be extended, executed by local subcontractors, which equates to over 150 employees in the Bay Area who rely on this work. 26% is the percent of DBE participation in the, in the work Conduit has proposed. Sending these jobs and local economic development dollars across the country, predominantly for an untested solution, through a less experienced vendor just doesn't make sense to us. In closing, I'll reiterate that a fair and well-organized multi-vendor pilot makes an abundance of sense. It'll yield a better solution for BART and its riders and reduce the risk of this, this project becoming successful. The board has my commitment to deliver an effective solution on time, as well as the backing of our company, Conduit's executive leadership, to dedicate the resources needed to make this pilot a success. Thank you again for this opportunity to speak. Conduit, our local Bay Area team, and a local Bayer partner stayed ready to assist BART in this important mission. Thanks again. Thank you, Frank. Madam Secretary, do we have any additional virtual public comment? No. All right. Um, I do have three speaker cards, so let us start with um, Keith Fox. If you can come forward to the podium, we will be happy to entertain your public comment to us. Just a reminder for our public speakers, we have a three-minute public comment limit and with that i'll turn it over to keith uh, good morning board members uh, thanks for having me my name is keith fox i'm director of account management for conduit transportation you just heard from my boss uh, frank harrison uh, and i'm here to speak on behalf of the local team that prepared this response for the BART Fairgate project. Um, Frank also mentioned, I mean, first conduit, we have a large local presence here in the Bay Area. Um, our bid included 31% of the solution to be executed by local subcontractors. 
Um, that employs hundreds of Bay Area workers, hundreds of Bay Area families, um, and supports them. And so uh, I have a letter that I'd like to submit, uh, I gave in the packet, from Brian Pisano. He's the CEO of Amtec in Pleasanton, uh, a vendor that's done work for BART in the past. Uh, he was listed some kind of subcontractor on our bid, um, and glad that you know we, we pulled together a good local team. Um, I'd like to add that you know our DBE percentage was actually 26 percent, uh, which is far above the 4 percent and 11 percent of the uh, the bid for mass traffic. Um, we do we have 25 years of experience in the Bay Area. Uh, I worked uh, significantly in the Bay Area on on transit projects. Um, we have projects with MTC, with SFMTA, City of Oakland, Sam Trans, AC Transit. Um, we have local offices in Oakland and in San Francisco, uh, and that employs over 300 workers. When we combine that with the project that we'd be doing here, that would be looking at you know a total of 600 workers that Conduit would be uh, employing in the Bay Area. Uh, secondly, on experience, which we alluded to or talked about earlier. Um, Conduit has proven fare evasion ex experience in our solution with a 3D sensor fare gates. Uh, it's been successfully deployed in Paris uh, specifically to combat fare evasion uh, in comparison to S traffic, which has a reference from Washington, D.C., where their fare gates, they, have, they didn't have fare evasion capability. WMATA recently issued a $40 million change order uh, to add that fare evasion capability but it's yet, yet to be proven. But, and lastly, most important, I think, to BART and, and BART riders is that condiments ready to put forward a fare gate solution in a pilot that uh, Frank had mentioned previously. Um, it would not cause delays. We, we feel if, if both vendors provided the, were provided the specifications for stations, for software integration, info on the cubic readers, API connections, uh, Conduit could deliver on schedule to these specifications, uh, and BART would be able to make an objective assessment on live fare gates being used by riders, and the results would be measurable, verifiable by BART staff uh, to choose the best solution going forward. Um, so we ask you to consider the opportunity to test both gates <laughs> in, in this pilot uh, idea and to make the final determination upon successful completion of a competitive pilot. So our, our local team stands ready, and I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you, Keith. Uh, the next public commenter I have is Michael Burnick. Um, I'm hanging out the letter, but um, I'm Michael Burnick. I'm with Dwayne Morris, we're the attorneys for Conduit. And um, first want to say a lot of time was put into that Conduit letter in terms of resources and thinking about this, and I really hope the board will um, go through it seriously. I think it raises questions, important questions concerning technical ability, concerning experience, concerning the local team, um, the DBE. So I, I, a lot of time, as I say, and thinking. I want to focus, though, on one part of that letter, which is the option, the pilot option that Frank talked about and Keith talked about, and um, why I think it's a real solution. It doesn't need to take 15 to 18 months. In fact, it doesn't take, need to take any additional time. Um, and I want to say four things about that um, based on at least the now nearly 45 years of experience I've had in government some years on this board, but also in a series of positions in our state government and today um, on the boards of several of our large state nonprofits. And these four points are, one, transparency and competition, I've found, uh, always get the best product. What Conduit is proposing is, uh, BART is already doing a pilot. So it's a matter of adding say another station or however staff think the best way of doing it, but having the two firms put in their product and set metrics and have it an open competition. And if our friends at F's traffic perform better, then they should get all 700 gates. But then we have an open competition, everything's uh, available, and we're able to take advantage of 
the expertise of our staff, line staff, our transit friends. Um, I, I will tell you, I've always found that competition transparency the best. Two, I know the board doesn't want to delay this. There's a sense of urgency. There is no, no reason this can't be done in seven months. Conduit certainly is able to do it within seven months or less. And um, there's no reason that this should uh, present any delay to say nothing of this very large delay of months. Three, um, there is an incremental cost, but it's more than outweighed, I would argue, by the de-risking, given that it's really an untested technology in the States. And four, um, in my experience, it's always good to do it right at the start. You save a lot of time and cost down the line. And I think just looking at one of our big rail projects in the Central Valley, we see that. So I hope the board will consider the option of two pilots, open competition, and see who performs the best in a real-time, real-life situation. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, my last public speaker is Paul Korshak. Paul, if you're here. Good morning, directors. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. And <clears throat> we, um, as traffic, are very thankful and honored by the recommendation of the BART team to award the contract to S Traffic. Uh, the journey of this process began three years ago as we began <clears throat> reacting to and studying the BART system uh, and understanding the Bay Area community. And we wanted to thank the board and the team for all of the information that was available through the board process and the public process but in particular, the individual board members' comments on the process as we learn more about <clears throat> the points of view and the uh, communities that you each represented. Um, the journey continues. Uh, our staff arrived early this week. In fact, uh, our chairman uh, and CEO, Ken Cho, is here along with 17 other people. Uh, and they began writing the system <clears throat> one a uh, person in particular who hadn't been to San Francisco, I have to admit, went to visit the Golden Gate Bridge first, but then rode the system. Um, <clears throat> but all seriousness, we look at the system from the inside out, and we want to make sure we touch the ground, meet the people, and understand the community. <clears throat> and to that end, we will always be doing that throughout the process. We still have a lot to learn, but we do know a lot. That is, <clears throat> we have experience producing 16,000 fare gates very successfully on time, on budget, in those many uh, locations <clears throat> that, was, uh, that were presented uh, to the board. Um, we also have a very experienced team, over 400 years of collective experience, and we've assembled a very important team. They're meant to complement us, not just do things that are ancillary, but really to contribute fully and in a complementary way to add dimension to what we do. And what we do <clears throat> is not only fare gates, AFC systems, system integration uh, in many different ways. That is, <clears throat> not only with legacy systems, with third party systems, uh, different technologies, <clears throat> excuse me, and with different agencies in a regional setting. That experience has been brought together in this team, which consists of not only S traffic personnel, but also uh, some DBE uh, providers, E Square, BST Engineering, <clears throat> who's local, also Pride Resources, which is uh, a DBE supplier in the state of California. Each of them bring a very special dimension to our team. We also have a very important uh, uh, manufacturing fabrication company, Kiosk, which also has an extraordinary diversity record um, and also tremendous amount of experience in providing not only fair gates, but also other types of self-service uh, pieces of equipment. So we wanted to end on that note and say thank you again for the recommendation. We look forward working with the BART team and providing new technology, new fair gates, and more importantly, the highest performance and the best possible customer experience to all riders in the Bay Area. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Madam Secretary, do we have any additional public comment? No. 
All right, let me turn to director's comments. I have four folks in the queue. Uh, directors Rayburn, Allen, Lee, and Simon. So let me start with Director Rayburn. Thank you very much, Chair Foley. And I want to thank Sylvia and Wendy, your entire team for the hard work that you've done in not just putting it together a solid bid proposal and process, but also concocting our very own home-built gates. We have the in-house expertise that I think everybody else in the nation and the world can admire. Um, and you are the ideal people to select who's best prepared to deliver our gates. I appreciate hearing from competing firms, and um, my concern would be that the procedural aspect of the bid, we would need to go back out and rebid in order to offer a procedure that would include all three, uh, maybe four, maybe more people would say, hey, I want to be part of this bid process. So um, I'm going to be very blunt. I am going to support the motion that's on the floor. But I do have one question, and it's, it's really a concern. Looking at the page 13, I squinted and saw that one of the charts shows, well, there could be a message that the barrier is not closed. And that would be a failure that would be, represent, in my words, a weak link in the system if we have a wide open fair gate in an array of gates. Um, that's an unacceptable situation for us. I want to request that <coughs> our staff and the successful bidder work to make sure that the default position of the gate would be closed. And if a gate is not closed, that there be an option to manually latch the gate closed. I think that that, along with having that overhead sign that would indicate that this gate is out of service, that would provide, meet the needs that I see on a daily basis in our system. So if we can move forward in this with, I know I'm asking for technical designs from the dais, but um, it's something that I hold very near and dear because I believe our overall game, game plan is to achieve a fair barrier that will number the days of fair evaders. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rayburn. Director Allen. Thank you, Chair Foley. Um, you know, I came to the BART Board in December of 2016. Uh, and I only had a few major initiatives in mind when, when I ran for this position. Um, stronger oversight, fiscal sustainability, and improving the rider experience. And this project before us today is gonna go a long way in improving the rider experience. It's been a long time in coming. Uh, the project has waxed and waned at times with some of the craziest ideas uh, for designs like inverted guillotines and double-decker skull crushers. Um, and the public had a lot of fun with it. Um, but, um, you know, at times there was a, I felt there was a whole lot of stalling uh, along the way as well. Uh, we went through, as we went through changes in management, in the M&E and capital projects groups. Um, that said, I am thrilled that we are here today and, and we are where we are today. Uh, this is one of the very few, maybe the only, capital projects that we have uh, planned with a 20-year asset life uh, that will not only pay for itself in five to seven years through added rider revenue, reduced maintenance costs, 
and an improved writer experience, but this project, I believe, will have a significant positive impact on our operating budget, which we're gonna talk about later today. This project will help curb uh, some, of our, some of our deficit problems through added revenue and reduced maintenance costs. I've invested considerable hours behind the scenes for over five years in seeing this project come to fruition, including recent meetings with staff um, about the details, a lot of details of, of what we are buying and how it will improve our system. We are only here today, though, because of the hard work and dedication of a couple of people. Our Assistant General Manager of Infrastructure, Sylvia Lamb, uh, our, our Assistant General Manager of Operations, Shane Edwards, and um, their bosses, I won't forget you, Bob and Michael, uh, who has supported them along the way in this, um, but also the continued pressure from the public, the riders, and the Bay Area journalists who went out and spent, I don't know how many hours they spent videotaping fair evasion and bringing it to light and bringing it to everyone's attention. So thank you to all of those people. Um, the project will go a long way in curbing the bad behavior, um, the drug use, the cleanliness issues, the crime that our riders are forced to live with every time they get on a train. It's imperative to our customer experience and the return of riders to get this done as quickly as possible. But it is also imperative to our operating budget. I do have one ask of our, I have a question for our chief counsel, uh, Burroughs, do we have a strong contract remedy during the pilot period for withdrawal from the contract should the vendor not provide what was promised? Yes, we do have a breach of contract provision that would allow us to terminate the contract. I believe that just, well, I'll stop there. Thank you. That's all I need was yes. <laughs> Um, with respect to the information presented uh, by Conduent, I appreciate the letters and the presentation, the, the testimony today, um, but the letters, um, frankly, I haven't even had a chance to read, um, so they, they may have come a little bit too late. Um, and uh, I did hear Director Rayburn say this, but I did want uh, our Chief Counsel to weigh in on what would happen if uh, or is it even possible to do a two-pilot competition on this procurement? Not without going out to bid again. Um, this was bid under the competitive negotiation statute that requires when we put out the RFP that we identify all significant evaluation factors upon which an award will be made. So a um, successful completion of a competitive pilot was not part of one of those evaluation criteria. Okay, thank you. And so um, I'll just close with, uh, you know, my meetings with staff and in learning of the, a lot of more details than you heard today. Um, I am, I'm, I am thrilled to, uh, not only did I already move the, the item, but I am, I hope my colleagues will join me in awarding this contract to S Traffic today. Thank you. Thank you, Director Allen. Let's turn to President Lee, followed by Director Simon. Thank you, VP Foley. Um, as has been the case since BART existed, we are seeking yet another bespoke solution for our incredibly bespoke system, which I think is the most Bay Area thing we could do. So thank you so much to our engineering team to be creative. BART staff has actually done a significant amount of legwork to innovate that bespoke solution through our prototyping, our piloting, and more. This innovative work has allowed us to significantly decrease the cost of full fare gate replacement across our system and to know exactly what we want a vendor to do with a very lengthy list of specs to meet our needs. I read the SF Chronicle article and I heard it was 70 pages of specs, which I cannot imagine is what we normally send out um, in an RFP. Um, so Sylvia, I actually had just a couple questions. Are you aware of any transit agency in the country, in the world, that has gone through the same or at least a very similar process to what BART is doing? Uh, I am not aware of that. Um, and just to clarify, my understanding is through the RFEI process, and I think through the RFP process, we asked for a pneumatic option to be considered. Can you talk a little bit more about the pneumatic versus um, electronic? 
Uh, yes, I wouldn't say that we asked for the pneumatic uh, system to be considered. We did, we did give the vendors all the information that we had. So we gave them what we were doing pneumatically and why we had uh, gone the pneumatic route and what benefit it was coming coming to us from. Yeah, and I actually like was doing a little searching and went back to the presentation that showed the results of the REI back, I don't know, two, three years ago when you presented this. And my understanding was that you found that there was a, no real off-the-shelf options for what we were looking for, certainly not for a pneumatic option, but it, in general, there wasn't. Can you talk about what some of those like unique pieces of what we are looking for are? Uh, well, I would say that most everything we saw, I don't think we saw anything that actually had the gates low enough that you couldn't crawl under or crawl over for one thing. The other thing is, um, and, and part of our specifications changed through, the, through our own innovation and pilots was the amount of pressure it takes to uh, push through the gates and that space. And we didn't see that on anything that was out uh, presented to us. I, I think other board directors have done this, but I did also go to the lab and do a lot of kicking against plexiglass, so I know what you mean. Um, thank you for answering those questions. I, I think this just clarifies and confirms, you know, what we are looking for. Just, it doesn't exist in the world, and the process we are going through has been thoughtful and it has been very unique. I also think that the Bay Area residents and the general public here in the Bay Area has asked BART to come up with new, a new Fairgate design that really goes above and beyond what any other transit agency in the world is asked to do, which is why we've gone through this very bespoke process. In particular, there is a very strong public opinion to, and I hear them too, to install Fairgates that can eliminate fare evasion, which to my knowledge is not possible. Most transit agencies have uh, really focused on fare evasion deterrence because elimination is incredibly, incredibly difficult, which is to say BART has a very high bar that has already been set for us by the public. As I mentioned, we went through the RFEI process. We quickly learned that what we are looking for didn't exist. Um, certainly not as an off-the-shelf option. Um, so I am not really swayed, honestly, at all by some of the arguments that say, oh, well, there's not this experience, and, you know, did you see what happened in D.C.? Not going to speak for WMATA. I'll just say I'm so grateful for the leadership we have here at BART with GM Powers, with Sylvia, with Shane, Wendy, um, and the geniuses we have here to set forward this process um, can't speak to what WMATA did. I'm just proud of what we're doing here at BART. And so um, I think that if a vendor has really gone above and beyond and excelled, especially in the technical scoring, um, that means that the specs that we set, that high bar that we've set, they're able to meet them. And that is probably the most convincing thing for me. Um, I really, um, we asked for a lot more additional information in this sort of two-stage approvals process. I really appreciate the level of detail in this presentation. I am very certain the general public, media outlets are excited to see some of the images, designs um, that are included. The, the timeline is very exciting to see. I think this is an, an ambitious timeline. So I feel very comfortable awarding this contract to S Traffic today. Um, I do really want to deeply thank Cubic and Conduit for your um, applications. I know that this isn't just like, it, it wasn't easy for you. This was not a, a quick, easy thing for you to do to put together these um, applications to our RFP. So um, I really, really deeply thank you all for your work there. Um, I had another thought, but it's escaped me. All that to say, um, I'm comfortable moving forward with S traffic today. Oh, I remember what it was. S traffic, don't mess this up, okay? <laughs> just don't mess this up. Don't come back to me and say, you know, a year from now and just be like, oh, this thing happened, we're slow. We can slap you with fines and fees, you know, as, you know, our general counsel can help us with that legal language. But I don't want to go there. I just want to, at the end of 2025, have 50 stations with amazing brand new fare gates that the public is so deeply appreciative of because I am going out to a bunch of counties asking them for money for this project for you and I'm really asking you, please deliver. We need you to do that timely, you know, and on budget. So with that, um, 
I'll end my comments. Thank you, President Lee. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, let me turn it to Director Simon, followed by Director Ames. I'll try to be very quick. Thank you, staff. Thank you, Shane, Wendy, and Sylvia, and of course, our executive team. Um, and again, all the staff um, for developing a beautiful presentation today. Um, I just have two thoughts that don't need to be answered today, but um, very curious about, and I'm hoping as this project moves forward, um, you all will update us um, on uh, these two questions. And they really go back to our, sorry, our current staff that we have. I'm wondering how do we propose with the selected contractor to deeply integrate the thoughts, the ideas, and I know this doesn't happen in the contracting process, but once the contract is developed, how can staff who are on the ground um, be uh, thoughtful, loud voices in uh, the selection of prototypes? Those of us who catch BART every day, we know that our station agents are sometimes uh, literally on their knees, moving wheelchairs, sometimes babies, suitcases, figuring out how uh, to get passengers who are having a very difficult time through the existing gates. And we know that when we did the prototype in Richmond, um, that staff, on the ground staff, had very little, if nothing to do, um, and weren't consulted, but the ones who were berated every single day when it didn't work, or when people um, were um, dismuffled going through. So I think it, um, to be important of all the feedback we got as board and staff during that process um, to ensure that there is staff, uh, deep staff input of the folks who will be on the ground every single day um, moving our passengers through. And I'm sure, and I know that we are going to do that, but I just wanted to lift that up in, in the boardroom. So thank you for that consideration. And I'm hoping it's a big part of uh, the process to make sure that all the staff are on board as we begin to implement. And secondly, it's, it's a question that doesn't need to be answered today. And again, know that it's in full heart and full mind of our staff, not just the contractor, I'm hoping both, but that as we begin um, installation, implementation, that we are also using our staff, our engineers, um, our smart folks who know the station in and out um, every single inch of those stations to help to ensure that, um, again, the construction and the installation um, is, is on par. So I'm hoping in the updates, if we can make sure that we talk about how staff, not just sort of our, our lead management staff um, and, and your team, Sylvia, are going to be a part of uh, the process moving forward. That's really important to me. Thank you. Thank you, Director Simon. Uh, Director Ames, followed by Director McPart. Okay, I am going to support this motion. I mean, this is a, this is history, history in the making, frankly. Um, and I, I want to also thank the police department uh, as well, because I know they really wanted these fair gates, and also they wanted the elevators enclosed. And we started that a long time ago in 2019, or maybe it was 2020, but we started enclosing the elevators first. Um, and I want to applaud staff's ingenuity of coming up, even with a pneumatic idea, even though that was a flop, <laughs> uh, you know, having these gates um, pneumatically closing. And we did the double decker. And I actually met with some students, some robotic students in Fremont, and they were so excited about the fair gates. They thought this innovation idea was tremendous. And we had BART staff show up to Fremont Station and they had these great ideas of trying to implement fare gates. They, they didn't want to see the fare evasion. It was happening right there at the station, and the kids were getting all upset. <laughs> and, um, so I want to thank the community as well, because they really did voice their concerns, along with the press. I mean, this really pushed us to this point, I believe. It really was. We listened to the riders in the community. Um, so I had a question about slide seven. We have a community engagement commitment. Um, and I'm fascinated by that slide because you've got some small child there looking at the computer. I don't know what they're doing. But I, I would like to see some you know, information on this later on. I mean, I don't know. It's probably going to happen after the seven months, the deployment phase. Um, so I'm excited to see that 2,000 hours to get the, the community involved, get the kids involved to see how these gates will work. I think there's a lot of folks that are interested about this project. Um, and I guess it, to, in response to these competitors, I, I do hear, you know, we, we need to be competitive. We need to get this project 
done quickly. And I know I've talked to Bob, you know, our general manager about this, of trying to get these gates in before we went to the voters for a measure. And I thought this was going to happen in 2024, but we have some time to 20, possibly 2026 is our target to go back to the voters. So I, I don't want any, any hiccups with this schedule. And you know how things go wrong. I mean, <laughs> things go wrong in engineering, and then we have to reinvent and do something else. So is it possible to consider these other ideas at in another RFP phase? I don't, I don't see a pilot taking 18 months. I'm just saying we need, we may want to consider a plan B because I want to see the deliverable. I, you know, I, I hope that we can do, we can deliver this by 2025, but you know, things can go wrong. And I wanted to know if there's an option to go out again and do maybe a piloting so we can complete by the deadline. What do you think about that? You know, Director Ames, I would say that, you know, our eggs are kind of in this basket. We're focused all in on making sure that S traffic is successful. If we find that they're not, we'll have to pivot. But, you know, you probably won't be looking at me in this chair, probably someone else in this chair at that point. So, um, in answer to your question, we're, we're focused on making sure S traffic delivers by 2026. So, I mean, if it doesn't turn out in the deployment phase, this is a seven month, right? The seven months are critical. So if it starts to not look so good, um, we could issue out another RFP, right? I mean, that's that would be plan B. We, we could pivot in seven months, yes. And then it would possibly be another pilot, correct? We would do the same process. It just depends on how we pivot. I'm happy to talk to you offline on it. Okay. Well, I'm just hoping we can do something like that. And I appreciate everybody here talking about how they can compete with us and deliver the project. So it's great to see the, you know, the building community, the design community want to participate. So hopefully this doesn't happen, but I want to make sure we can deliver by the end of 2025 to put all the gates in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Ames. Um, Director McPartland, followed by Director Dufty. First of all, uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate all the work that everyone has done. Uh, I will have to end up saying that uh, the interview process ended up having a panel with uh, different representation from different departments, plans, M&A, um, and, and more, and procurement, and the list goes on. How refreshing from the standpoint of the way we've done it in the past where we are so stovepiped that uh, departments don't talk very well with one another. Uh, what a synergistic effect, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm giving all the, the credit to Sylvia. Thank you very much. You really are a stellar, you know. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, uh, Bob, could you give her a raise, please? <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, uh, there is uh, uh, the only stupid question is one that you really don't ask. And, uh, and it's, you know, pro forma. Um, we have the, the station agent has the ability to open up all the gates in the event of uh, access for emergency operations and evacuation, correct? Okay, thank you. Um, I have a personal history with one of the unsuccessful bidders and I was surprised. Um, uh, and thank you again for the presentation that we had last week. Uh, I am delighted. I'm, I've got a whole bunch of technical issues that uh, I could expand on, but everybody else here has already been taking up a lot of time. Thank you very much, and I am delighted to be in a position to vote on this and contribute to it. Thank you. Thank you, Director McPartland. Director Dufty. Thank you. Uh, first, I just want to thank all three companies that bid and participated in this process. I think it's very important to BART, and we appreciate that many of you have lived Fairgates for months uh, responding and having two you know, funding rounds or application rounds that took place. Uh, our board is very diverse. We come from very different backgrounds and, and political perspectives, but uh, I feel as though I can associate myself with all the remarks that were made today by our colleagues. I think fundamentally this is a question about integrity. 
does this agency have the ability to define what its needs are, to develop the engineering protocols and expertise to ensure that we get the right fare gates that come in here and to implement them on a schedule and, and start to turn the tide in terms of public perception about our agency's interest in, in deterring mm -hmm. fare evasion. Uh, I believe that this process has been completely uh, integrity. It, it, I am so impressed at the knowledge base that has been developed within this agency. I am confident that we are all going to work together to make sure that things go well and stay on track. But in the presentations that we've had at the board, I think that there, our staff has done a fantastic job of anticipating what some of the issues and problems are and really guiding us along to a path towards success. So uh, I share uh, Director Allen's uh, enthusiasm and um, gratitude that we are moving and, and getting this to happen. And, um, you know, I put, I put my integrity and credibility on the line in voting for this, and I am completely comfortable with casting that vote today. Thank you. Thank you, Director Dufty. Director Saltzman. Thank you. I just wanted to thank um, the whole team for all of your efforts over a long, long time and all your creativity. Um, and I just loved that the last slide actually thanks everybody by name. And I hope Bob will, Michael will do this in the future because I know almost everything that comes to the board, there's probably dozens of people working on it. So it's it's great to, to give credit to the full team. Um, and I appreciate everything you've done. And just, I don't think I've ever seen uh, anybody at BART come up to the podium with such joy on their face as I saw in Sylvia as she approached today. And I think that just kind of says it all, how good the whole team feels about this, how, how glad we are that we're at this point. It's very important for our riders. They've been asking for it. So excited to vote to move this forward today. Thank you, Director Saltzman. And I will wrap us up before we get to the vote. Um, Again, Sylvia, thank you to you. Thank you to your team. Um, as you've heard from all of my colleagues up here, let's keep everyone engaged as much as we can within the within BART in the district to keep that knowledge as well as we develop this, this fare gate system, um, which to S traffic, you know, this is probably the biggest concern we hear from ridership is around fare evasion and related activities that may occur from people that fare evade. So, um, this is a big deal. Um, in fact, if you don't know how much of a big deal it is, you know, Bart was the answer to a question on this week's this week's Weakest Link show. That's how big Bart is. So um, it really is a big deal for us. This allows us to get at hopefully a root cause for a lot of concerns that we have from the ridership perspective. So again, I thank you. I put my trust in you. Um, and I, I look forward to moving forward with this project. So with that, Madam Secretary, can we have a vote? Absolutely. Director Simon? Yes. Director Allen? Yes. <laughs> Director Ames? Yes. Director Dufty? Yes. Vice Chair Foley? Aye. Director McPartland? Aye. Director Rayburn? Yay. Director Salzman? And President Lee. Yes. The motion carries. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and with that, yes, exactly, a round of applause. Uh, President Lee, with that, I conclude the ENO committee and I turn the chair back to you. All right. Um, thank you for that. Um, so with excitement comes some sobering <laughs> realities as I pass it over to um, Director Dufty to chair our one admin item, which is on the fiscal year 2024 and fiscal year 2025 prelim budget. Thank you so much. And I, I just want to start and I, I would like to echo what um, Director Saltzman said about how great it was to see a, a sheet that listed all of those that have been involved. And obviously, what we have before us in our preliminary budget does reflect a, a, a group effort. Um, we'll take a one minute break.
Good morning. So our meeting is resuming, and we're good. So we have before us a presentation on the fiscal year 24 and 25 preliminary budget. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, Pam and Mike and Chris and, and Kathy Allegar of the performance and budget team representing a much larger group of, of that team that is working constantly to find efficiencies, look at policies to make sure that we're getting the maximum revenue that we can and, uh, I, and, and preserving the federal funds that we've received. So I want to really humbly thank um, this entire department and um, welcome Pam to start the presentation. So thank you, Chairperson Dufty. Uh, so this morning, Mike Eisman, Barts Director of Financial Planning, and I will walk you through the preliminary budget overview. Uh, we will start today with a high-level look at our fiscal year 23 year end estimate, and then move into the 24 and 25 preliminary budget revenues and expenditures, our proposed capital budget, and the next steps and timeline. Uh, more information on the fiscal year 23 year end estimate is included in the uh, second quarter financial report, which you all had in your consent calendar package today. Uh, however, I will let you know that halfway through the year, we are underperforming our budget. Uh, we are working to turn that around and are currently projecting to end the year with just a very small positive balance using <coughs> slightly less federal funds than we had initially budgeted. On the source side, fair revenue has underperformed and financial assistance, particularly sales tax, has done well. Taken together, the revenues are nearly on budget. On the expense side, however, labor is over budget, mainly due to lower than expected capital reimbursements, which is in part an, a timing issue, higher than anticipated overtime, and also the 3.5% July 1 wage increase that was approved after the budget was adopted last June. In addition, in the interest of conserving cash, uh, we plan to reduce budgeted payments to some transit operators and not make the budgeted Section 115 pension trust payment this year. To be clear, BART is fulfilling all of its CalPERS obligations. I am only referring to the Section 115 supplemental trust. Uh, on slide three, a few things to highlight before we jump into the preliminary budget. First, the budget document is posted online at BART.gov. Second, uh, while not in the preliminary budget, because it was somewhat late breaking news, but it will be included in the adopted budget are two things. Uh, one is the increase to the Inspector General's budget, and two is a full integration of the new Office of Infrastructure Delivery, which is headed by apparently the board fan favorite of Sylvia Lamb. <laughs> Um, so finally, we spent a lot of time last year discussing vacancies, uh, vacancy rates, and um, at this time last year we budgeted a 10% vacancy rate for fiscal year 23, 7.5% um, for 24, and 5% for 25. While it varies from month to month, our vacancy rate um, is actually edging pretty close to our FY24 assumption. Um, this will create some pressure on our operating budget, so we're going to kind of review that as we move into the final uh, budget adoption. But on the right side, this means that we have more uh, frontline staff than we did a year ago, thanks to the strong hiring efforts by our HR team. So I'll turn it over to Mike for the next few slides. Uh, thank you, Pam. Good morning, directors. Um, I'll just start here by reorienting us to the fiscal outlook as it was considered at the February board workshop, uh, where we last discussed our deficit. Uh, the board had a robust discussion then, uh, some highlights of which you see included here on the slide. Um, that discussion has guided our budget development. In response to board input on this slide, you can see a summary of all the changes we've made uh, and, how we're, and how they've impacted the budget uh, deficit projection in the preliminary budget. Uh, these reductions are not choices we want to make, but we know we need to get our ongoing operating expense down. Uh, the columns on this uh, table here show changes in the deficit in fiscal 24 and 25. All of these reductions help drive the fiscal 25 deficit down. With the exception of priority capital, uh, where we have deferred costs based on anticipated project cash flow needs, these other changes reduce ongoing uh, operating uses. I will note here, um, not everything discussed in the board workshop is included, and there are a number of options we are still scoping. The new five-year outlook table here shows the change from the board workshop to preliminary budget. 
uh, revenues and expenses are shown on the rows uh, where the columns are the fiscal years. Cost savings expected in fiscal 23, 24, and 25 allow us to retain more federal funding to put towards the fiscal 25 deficit. The new projection in the fiscal 25 uh, is a deficit of 78 million, down 65 million uh, from a starting place of 143 million. Though these changes shave 100 million or so off of our five-year deficit, we know that's not enough, and the total gap is still just over a billion dollars over that five-year period. This table is a summary uh, of our preliminary uh, fiscal 24 and 25 sources and uses. Uh, you'll see greater detail on each row here in, over the next um, few minutes. Just to reorient you to our format, the rows show revenues and expenditures, while the columns show fiscal 23 uh, adopted budget, followed by FY24 and 25 preliminary numbers with year-over-year -year dollar and percentage change columns. Um, this slide summarizes the ridership outlook in the preliminary budget, which is unchanged from the board workshop uh, version. Actuals are shown in orange. The blue dotted line is our projected trend line. Uh, the gray solid line is the preliminary budget assumption, uh, which factors in seasonality. And then we have a range of uncertainty uh, in the gray shading. Oh, uh, fiscal 23, oh, if you could stay there for a minute, thank you. Uh, fiscal 23 ridership is 11% below budget through the end of March. Based on recent trends and survey data, our budget assumes only modest continued growth in ridership. It also assumes the exaggerated seasonal ups and downs we've become familiar with over the last couple of years. This slide provides more detail on our operating revenue sources in the preliminary budget. Rail passenger revenue is budgeted at 222 million in fiscal 23. But the ridership trend projected on the prior slide uh, puts us at uh, 30, 30, 30 to 35 million below budget in our year-end estimate of about 190 million. From that base, we're budgeting a year-over-year -year increase of 19% in fiscal 24 and a further increase of 13% for fiscal 25. This estimate does assume 5.5% fare increases in fiscal 24 and 25. Parking revenue forecasts are driven by ridership projections as well as fluctuations in parking supply. Other operating revenues, such as ground lease, telecom, and rentals, reflect both ridership and individual contract elements. This slide details financial assistance revenue in the preliminary budget. Our sales tax year-end estimate is about $16 million above fiscal 23 budget. From that base, we have fairly cautious growth assumptions for fiscal 24 and 25, given economic uncertainty. Property tax growth assumptions of 5 to 6% per year are in line with our historic trends and reflect county forecasts where available. Note that our state transit assistance outlook has been lowered a bit from where it was in February. Growth of the underlying diesel sales tax revenue is actually looking stronger than ever, but we're being more cautious, cautious here with potential impact of hold harmless provision expiration. We're budgeting significantly lower revenue from low carbon fuel standard credit sales as we've, than we've seen in, in the recent past due to low market prices. And to wrap up on revenue, this image shows our revenue trend from fiscal 19 uh, through the FY25 preliminary budget. In the dark blue, it shows our traditional financial assistance revenue has been overall very stable through the period, while our operating revenue collapsed in fiscal 21 and remains hundreds of millions of dollars below its pre-pandemic levels through the end of this budget period. In green, we show federal emergency assistance that has sustained our operations through this period. Again, we expect to use the last of our federal funding during the fiscal 25 budget period. Okay, so I'll now take, I'll, I will take you now through the expense side and conclusion of this presentation. The table on this slide shows our labor budget, salaries, benefits, and retirement costs for the upcoming two fiscal years. I want to highlight a couple of points. First, wages, which are in the top row, are increasing by two factors. One, as I discussed earlier, we are in the process of stepping down our vacancy rate assumption. The assumption of more filled positions in our budget increases the budgeted labor costs. Second, the fiscal year 23 budget was adopted before the district finalized the labor agreements to raise wages by 3.5, 3% and 4% between 23, 24, and 25. This means that the fiscal year 23 budget did not include the wage increase, and this table includes the wage increase for FY24 and FY25. 
On the benefits side, it is important to note that we have several potential changes coming as we work with our independent third party actuaries. So uh, the board should be prepared to see some sig potentially significant revisions, uh, largely unfortunately in the name of expense increases when we come back to you with more detail on May 11th. Uh, slide 13 summarizes our proposed full-time equivalent position changes. We are not proposing to add any positions to the fiscal year 24 budget, although in fiscal year 23, we are moving uh, 31 positions to the operating budget to better reflect the work that these positions are currently doing, and we are making a few other small adjustments. Next slide. Moving on to non-labor, we've uh, done a pretty good job of controlling costs on non-labor throughout the, each year of the pandemic, but there are two categories that we are seeing some cost increased pressures. Uh, the first one is Clipper, with Clipper fees, which is on the first row of this table. Um, as we transition to the Clipper 2 system, we will have two systems running in parallel for a period of time. And while it is a cost to the regional operators and also MTC, moving to C2 will improve the rider experience. We are also actively monitoring power. I'm sure that many of you have seen increases in your own utility bills, and power cross, uh, BARD, BARD is not immune to that pressure. Although we have several longstanding power purchase agreements in place, there are a couple, there is a segment of our power purchasing that is subject to market fluctuations, and that has forced us into exceeding our budget for the past several months. We are working with Val's team to better understand any ongoing impacts and we may revise our power budget further upward by the time we see you back here in May. So despite strong inflation that we've all been experiencing and these noted cost pressures, we are budgeting um, non-labor increases um, very small at, at the range of two to 3% in the next two years. On slide 15, we cover debt service and allocations. And as Mike mentioned previously, we're making some changes to our allocations budget for 24 and 25. Um, so I won't spend much time here, but I will reiterate that we are not electing to add funds to the district section 115 retirement trust in 24 or 25. I mentioned 23 earlier, but we will continue to meet all pension and retirement related obligations. On slide 16, this shows our fiscal runway, and I'm going to ask you all to be patient with the budget team as this runway moves a little bit back and forth as we finalize our budget. We saw you, uh, I think, when we released the preliminary budget and the runway we were projecting at that time ended in January. We've reduced our, our projected expenses, um, and at, uh, over the next couple of years, that's moving it back out to March. Our goal is to move it as far to the right as we can, um, but right now we're projecting the end of the fiscal runway in March. <clears throat> On slide 17, this slide and the one that follows shows our preliminary fiscal year 24 and 25 capital budgets budgeted at 1.5 billion and 1.4 billion respectively. So last week, you all received a very good, very informative second quarter capital project status report from Sylvia Lamb. So I won't go into much detail on these slides because th that report is much more extensive. Uh, but I will orient you to a little, a little bit on how the information is presented in these summary tables. The capital improvement program categories, which are this table on the left, there's 10 rows which represent 10 major uh, ca categories by which BART's capital program is defined. You can see in the top two rows, which makes up approximately 50% of the fiscal year 24 budget, that's rail cars and train control. Now, CI CIP purpose, those are the colors of the bars that you see here, that re represents the type of capital um, investment, such as system reinvestment um, or service and capacity enhancement. And as in our past years, system reinvestment is the primary focus of our capital program. So I'll skip, oh, actually one other thing I do wanna note is that funding sources on the right-hand side re reflect major funding categories such as RR, uh, FTA funds, um, and other federal, state, regional, and local funds, and also BART funds. As we review our capital budget, I do know that we will be recategorizing uh, to uh, some of these capital funding sources to better reflect how, these, how the capital investments may be funded. So expect a little bit of change in the, how we attribute the capital funding sources to each category as we move into the final budget. Uh, next slide, please. So in, actually one more beyond that. Thank you. So in closing, the preliminary budget is effectively BART's budget proposal and represents a starting point for discussion between the board, BART staff, and the public on our budget. 
We will continue to evaluate and develop opportunities to reduce spending or increase revenue with the goal of not impacting the service that we currently operate. We will update you, the public and stakeholders as we proceed through the budget process this spring. District leadership um, under Rod and Bob Powers are doing great work to advocate for BART funding needs at the state level. We'll be hearing more about that. And as we've touched upon several times in this presentation, please do expect revisions to our pre preliminary budget as we move towards the May 11th sources and uses presentation. Uh, next slide. This is the last slide in the deck. It's a timeline of what, uh, the various topics that we'll be bringing to each of the board meetings. And I thank you for your time. And at this point, Mike and I are happy to take any questions. Thank you. And I will start just seeing if there are any public comments. Yes. Speakers. Thank we you. We do have a Zoom public commenter, Alita Dupree. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, th thank you, uh, Chair Bevan Dufty uh, and members. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her, uh, I appreciate your leave to speak. I have standing. I'm a fair paying writer of art. Uh, good presentation. I always appreciate uh, the presentations from Pam and the team. Uh, I appreciate the mention about Clipper. Uh, hopefully we'll get more people on the trains and that'll be a good reason for uh, Clipper uh, fees to increase because it is still the best way uh, to collect uh, money in the long term. And uh, power, I've talked about power quite a bit before. I, I am not familiar with how people in BART uh, source electricity for their homes. I have written to you that I am simply an ordinary user of residential electricity. Um, so I can only speak from my own experience, but we do have to really keep after uh, the power and, and find out how to buy uh, as much renewable power as we can. And it is proven that renewable power is increasingly cheaper uh, than non-renewable power. So we want to get out there in the market and buy as much of that as we can and work on uh, things such as uh, demand management because those demand spikes can be very costly. Um, soon we're going to be, I'm sure, talking about fares. And uh, I, I re-enlighten you that the uh, discount for senior and disabled, of which I am one, is 62.5%. I ask that you not reduce that uh, in trying to make a uh, budget uh, because uh, we depend on that. Uh, we who use reduced fare uh, have needs that are documented and unique and recognizable. I ask that you not use the senior and disabled community as a means to try to raise more money. When we ride, we're not seeking to upend your budget. We're simply seeking to do what we need to do to live our lives in the best way that we can. Um, I, I hope that we can get our staffing up. I did not notice any canceled trains on my last visit, uh, but I am concerned about that. So, I mean, we don't wanna run with austere staffing. So I can understand why our labor is going up. And I did hear a mention about transfer payments to other transit operators. I really don't understand that. That should be clarified because if we're not paying something, I mean, if it's due, it should be paid. So I'm looking forward to the development of this budget in the hearing and that this budget always has to reflect the idea that Florida is the people system. Thank you. Any additional public comment speakers? No further public comment or at this time. Thank you. Now we'll turn to director questions and comments. Director Rayburn. Thank you, Chair Dufty. I want to first and foremost thank Pam and Michael and your entire staff for putting together a thorough report. And I feel that there's some serious belt tightening to be done here. Um, and there are many areas of concern, but I think we should always be incredibly transparent with, for example, it was just mentioned by Ms. Dupree that uh, our payments to our transit partners. I want to make sure that 
they're well informed in advance. And I'm not certain that that word has gone out yet. As well, I feel that we need, we expect to see changes in the retirement medical. And I don't know if that discussion has been had yet with our labor partners. I feel that, you know, we're looking at bumping up payments or changing the amortization. Am I correct? Um, uh, Director Rayburn, we are not proposing to make any changes with the benefits that our labor partners experience. Um, one of the things that we are aware of, and I think this will come back to the board, um, at a meeting in May is a, as an overview from our actuaries of the Retiree Health Benefit Trust. And, and as we know, the 11-year period that we have left for amortization does create significant pressure on BART uh, in making our obligation when uh, we see negative uh, market rate returns. Okay, so there will be a, a very deep drill down in May with what Bartol and Company. Yes, I, I believe it is on the agenda for um, the May 11th meeting. Uh, so Bartel, which is now known as Fosters and Fosters, will be coming to present to Bart. All right. And finally, um, we had a, a very extreme power spike uh, cost in January that uh, I hope it represents a one-time measure. But we're on sort of a, a collision path, as I see it, because part of the budget cost cuts are to uh, reduce sustainability, actually eliminate sustainability uh, expenditures of six and a half million. And I, I want to make certain that, you know, the achievements that we've made over the past few years in reaching uh, zero greenhouse gas emissions have been uh, substantial uh, and, and really unprecedented uh, for large agencies like us throughout the country. Um, and I want to make certain that we retain the managers for those power systems um, that we're able to see uh, the maybe the benefits from the filled reservoirs now uh, pay some dividends in the future. So that's... Just to be clear, we are not proposing any staffing changes on the sustainability team. They still, they still have prior year allocations to the sustainability program to work with for the time being. We are proposing to suspend uh, future payments to this, or future allocations to that sustainability team for the time being. To so preserve. I'm uncertain how you will shift six and a half million dollars by removing it from the sustainability budget in the LC top funds. So it's L LCSF, LCFS, LCSF, I'm yes, sorry. LCFS credits. So what we're proposing, the, you may recall the board adopted a policy that directed 50% to uh, the sustainability group and 50% to operate the operating budget. What we are proposing, uh, which is, I think, believe we did it one or, two, one or two years already in the pandemic, is to pull 100% of the funds into the operating program for one very key reason, and that is to maintain maximum flexibility as we focus on putting out rail service. Um, we still have, you know, we still have about maybe, I think it's on the order of about nine, six to nine million dollars in the sustainability team's bucket for, for them to work on and develop programs. So we're not at all proposing that we back off on work that we've already committed to, but we are, and you're gonna hear this from me over and over, we need to maintain maximum flexibility in our fund sources so that we can shift and adapt to, you know, carry, moving our fiscal runway to the right. Of course, and, and again, we have many partners out there that do want to, they, they feel our pain, and we need to make sure that they're well informed of the processes that we're taking to uh, reduce our spending uh, in order to reduce the amount of money that we're asking for from uh, whether it be the voters or from the state. 
I, I will assure you both agencies have been informed and we've had discussions. Let's keep this transparent dialogue going. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Saltzman. Thank you. Um, thanks for this presentation and for all the work that you've done on the budget. I know it's a challenging time, um, and I appreciate that you were able to identify some savings so far and are looking for more savings so we can extend our runway. Um, I just want to talk about two things for today. I'm sure I'll have more as we go through these various presentations over the next couple of months. Um, but one is the fare increase, and I appreciate that we now have the memo that shows the difference between a 5.5% increase twice two years in a row um, and the 4% increase and actually shows what that means for the riders. And I'd encourage all my fellow directors to read that memo that Pam sent us, I believe yesterday or the day before. Um, and, you know, I, I've said this before and I, I just want to reiterate it that I, I will not support the five and a half percent increase twice, um, which is really a 11 or more compounded, more than 11% increase. Um, I think it hits riders really hard and we're finding a lot of our riders um, that are sort of the on the bubble rider, maybe riding, maybe not, they have other options um, or they're doing it for social activities that maybe they just wouldn't do that activity otherwise. Um, and so I think we need to be really thoughtful. I do of course support um, increasing the discount for the lowest income riders, but that really is for the lowest income riders. So there's a whole nother group of people who aren't making a whole lot of money, who are struggling day to day, making different choices with their budgets, different decisions. And this will have a real impact when their fare is going up nearly a dollar each way, so really $2 a day. Um, you start thinking about get other ways of getting around or changing the ways you move around. Um, so I can't support it. I, I could support some smaller increase, but I, I just I want to make it clear throughout the process so nobody's surprised where I'm at. Um, and if you look at the revenue difference between the four and the five and a half percent, considering the hole in our budget, it really is not significant, the difference. So it's not like it's going to make or break our budget, whichever one we do. Either way, we're in trouble. So that's where I am on the fares. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up was service. Um, this was noted, I have no idea which page in the budget memo, which I read all of it. Um, but it was noted sort of as a side comment that, you know, our staffing levels might mean that we're going to have more, we're going to continue to have misruns. So I'd like to know more about that because um, that was frightening to, to see in the budget memo and what, what exactly that means. So, Director Saltzman, I think uh, we will have a very detailed uh, and in-depth uh, a presentation on service at the first meeting in May uh, prior to sources and uses so you can excuse me April 27th my bad two weeks from today so that the full board can have wrap its arms around what we're thinking about service and how we might be able to enhance without increasing overall labor costs so mm -hmm. if okay. you would bear with us for a couple but, of but weeks. if you can make sure that presentation answers this the it was in the budget memo so if you could explain more about why there will continue to be misruns, how many we expect to have, um, that would be helpful to know. And particularly at our levels of service on the evenings and weekends, those misruns, I just talked about this at the last meeting again, have a really big impact. It can mean you're you know, waiting for up to an hour for a train, so they're really not acceptable. Um, I know there's work, uh, you know, I know there, that we're looking into how we can increase the off-peak service. I continue to think that's the most important thing we can do to bring back riders. We're not gonna, you know, fix our budget um, crisis in the long run without getting more riders who are using BART for any reason besides getting to work. We're, even if, you know, we capture back all of the riders who used to take BART who are now going to work the two days a week or whatever they are, we're still not going to get there. So we have to get more of these riders on the weekends, in the evenings. We have to figure out a way to increase service. Thank you. Thank you. Director Ames? Yeah, I, I do think that the fare increase is excessive. Um, so I do support reducing that at some level. I don't know what that would be, but it was based on that 
really high inflation that we experienced, and now this is starting to reduce. Um, it's not as low as we'd want, but I think initially it was like at 11%, and now we're somewhere around 9% of inflation, or 8%. Um, and then the other issue I have is uh, the, I'm looking on slide five, I guess it's slide five, um, and it's, the, it's related to overtime, restrict overtime uh, to 8 million increase, I suppose that's what that is. Uh, and I recall in, in 2019, FY 2019, our overtime was roughly around 50 million, and now we're, we're looking at 70 million. Um, so I'd like to see if, this, if staff could look at this use of overtime and really scrub each department and say, you know, is it necessary that each department have overtime? I mean, what are the areas that are really essential? Of course, we have to run our trains on time, but, you know, can we look at each department's overtime usage and really look at ways to reduce overtime? I think that would be a good exercise to perform because it just keeps inching its way up when we really to need, need to ratchet this down. Is this something possible that the staff can look at? Uh, yes, I'll jump in first just to note that over the past few fiscal years, we've improved our budgeting process for overtime and now budget total overtime, which is what you see at 70.8 million in FY23, um, and, and also capital overtime, which is a deduction or reimbursement to the labor budget from capital project overtime. That's 22.4 million. Um, so if you do, you know, if you do the math, and I'm a little rusty when I do it in my head, but it's somewhere below 50 million for overtime when you net that out. So, so that's one thing I just want to point out. And um, I know Michael can jump in a little bit because he's more closely in tune with it. But the budget department does track and report overtime by department. Uh, obviously, the biggest drivers of overtime are those departments and operations and the police department. So that's where we really focus all our effort on tracking, monitoring, and then Mike has been participating in some biweekly meetings to further dial that in, and I'll let you take it. I would just say, Director Ames, that we are looking at overtime on a very granular level, which involves uh, every uh, operations uh, chief and, and uh, senior manager below their level um, certifying to Shane and, and the police chief on, on the police side and me before payroll is processed that the overtime was uh, one worked, as well as the overtime was necessary to perform the task. So I, I think you'll see a significant reduction in that overtime, although we still have significant vacancies, so some overtime is obviously going to be necessary. Well, I appreciate every department scrubbing this issue, looking at the overtime, because um, there are ways to just say, you know what, we don't need to do that extra time. Maybe we can work with each other, like different departments, like from purchasing uh, like a purchasing perspective where the stores folks are providing materials and um, there is like a scheduling issue between operations and stores. And so maybe they can, if they're ordering a part for op in, in operations, that that part would be in the queue for several weeks as opposed to asking for a part in 24 hours. So you don't have this rush of ordering of parts. I hope, I, I hope I'm not getting too much in the weeds. I guess I am. But um, there's, there's ways to work with operations and stores, for example, to reduce the overtime in stores. Uh, and this is the kind of thing I'd like to see the staff look at. And I appreciate um, the general manager's memo that went out saying we're trying to reduce costs. That was, that was good to see. And I'd hope to see the same kind of memo on overtime. I mean, frankly, this is something that we need to, to flesh out. So, uh, let me think of any other issue. Um, and then finally, just on ridership revenue. Uh, so I know we ha we're embracing this new phenomenon, which I think is going to go forward in the future, it would work from home. So. Can we look at ridership models embracing this rider, you know, work from home scenario? Because I think in the, in the future, it's going to increase. I mean, technology is going to improve. I'm sure there's venture capitalists right now working on plan ways to monitor staff's time at home uh, to show that there's like efficiencies are gained here. You're getting the product that you want from your workforce that's working from home. 
So I think this is going to increase over time, slowly. So I think there's got to be like a product. I don't know. I'm thinking like a two-day pass or three-day pass for the workforce that's staying at home two to three days. So they might take BART for those days they have to go into to the office. So I'm hoping we can kind of, we can study the psychology of how to get the folks out of their cars and incentivize them to take BART for those few days they're coming in to work. I mean, this is a psychological kind of like, what, what are the riders willing to pursue? Do they want, will they drive 45 minutes and they're willing to do that and not take BART? Or, you know, and if they are driving for 45 minutes, that's really, that's their sweet spot. They can do that for two or three days a week. Then how can we get that person to give up that 45 minute ride in their car and take BART for two, two to three days a week? That's the kind of idea I'm hoping we can study further. But thank you for this first try on reducing expenses. Thank you, it's really difficult. President Lee. Thank you, uh, Chair Dufty. Um, so thank you, as always, uh, to Pam, Chris, and Mike. And maybe it would be nice to, at some point, see the whole list of names I've gone into putting this report together and this presentation together. I really love that idea. Um, but I really appreciate you all for guiding the board through this process and taking the feedback from the board workshop in February. Um, I know it's been a lot of number crunching and conversations that led particularly to slide three, which summarizes the budget revisions, especially places where we are able to reduce our operating expenses. Um, I'm very aligned with what both Director Ames and Director Saltzman just said. I, I think a few of these lines need much more detail and explanation so we can understand the assumptions being made to make the budget reductions possible. Um, I, I agree with Director Ames. I, you know, I've talked to you, um, Pam, about seeing more detail around um, overtime restrictions. I am absolutely supportive of being smarter around overtime usage, um, but I, I really want to understand how you arrived at that eight million number. Is it too high? Is it too low? You know, um, I also really want to be clear about where we are making policy decisions via our budget. And I want to understand how much around restricting overtime is good governance, just, you know, being able to track it better, better understand and, you know, systematizing things that we have to so it's not, you know, you, overtime hours. Um, so I want to understand how much of that number is good governance um, around increasing accountability versus policy decisions around discretionary projects. For example, I know when one of us calls up Sylvia or Shane or Greg Lombardi and we're like, hey, you, you gotta clean up this mess at one of our stations. Sometimes that incurs overtime. Um, and we, when we as a board are like, oh, we wanna see more safety presence or we wanna see more regular cleanings of this and that, I, I recognize that a lot of times that is increase in overtime costs as well. Um, but I just want to really understand like, those assumptions so that we know what that means um, so that we aren't almost like accidentally or unintentionally making policy or even like labor decisions, um, you know, via some of these budget changes. Um, around deferring priority capital allocations, um, that's obviously a very large area of savings. Um, my understanding is that this is more of a realignment to actual schedules. Um, it would be helpful to see the breakdown of those projects and my apologies in advance um, if this is in the very detailed capital project size report that Sylvia sent out. I, I did not read it word for word. Um, <laughs> it would be good to have it, a summarized version as part of our budget process here. You know, wh what is that um, sort of alignment that's allowing us to have some of the budget savings that we see here? Um, so anyway, I think there's just a lot more detail there for us to understand. And, you know, if there are underlying policy decisions I think that will allow us to consider, do we want to push those policies even further for potential further, you know, cuts, but allow us to, I don't know, negotiate those trade-offs as part of our budget process. I think you understand what I mean there. Um, so moving on, I also really appreciate slide 11, which shows the trend over the past years for our operating sources. And to put it simply, we are really trying to figure out what the world looks like when that green bit on the bars go away. Um, 
the truth for me is that BART will be a total shell of itself if we cannot figure out how to fill that green bar. And we cannot consider service improvements or service increases until we figure out how to fill that green bar. So um, to my board colleagues, as a preview, I, I've been working with staff to invite uh, MTC and California Transit Association back to the board at our April 27th meeting. I know Rebecca Long and uh, Michael Pimentel joined us at our February board workshop. Um, I will say I'm very concerned at the slowness of the advocacy of MTC and CTA. I had been hoping, you know, they were like, you know, stop pushing for the, the measure until we have a better sense. You know, there's just so much we can do at the state level. Um, and I had optimistically, maybe foolishly, been hoping for this magical grand plan for what was going to be happening at the state level for us to fill in that green bar, um, acknowledging where our ridership is at. And there has been no you know, innovative, creative, new idea that significantly impacts our revenue sources, or, or especially for our operating budget. Um, and so I am deeply concerned about that. I think it's, it's really time for us as BART to, to move forward to figure out, you know, what that future looks like. But I know that's a much bigger conversation, but I'm just all preparing you all for that conversation on April 27th. Um, and then the last thing I'll note is um, I know Director uh, Ames and Salzman mentioned their concerns around fares. Um, I, it's going to be very hard for me to support this staff recommendation, recognizing all of the information around the trade-offs um, with the fare increases. Um, I think the first thing is um, I would like to make fare increases right now on a year-to-year -year basis just because the economy is so uh, dynamic and sort of chaotic right now. Um, so I, I would like to forego the fare increase for fiscal year 25 until we get to next May's budget approval. Um, I'm really concerned sort of just putting that in place and I don't think it helps us to put it out publicly because we know the media headlines are going to show the both years amount combined and not just, you know, our fare increase for this year. Um, and so then it's a question of whether was it the 5.5 um, for this year is too high. Um, and I think it is. I think uh, Director Salzman has sort of illustrated very clearly, you know, the impact that that has. And while, of course, I'm very supportive of the Clipper Start discounts, I actually just looked it up. If you are in a family of four, you have an annual income of 55,500 or less in order to qualify for Clipper Start. That is just not a lot of money. Um, and uh, if you're just a one person household, that annual income is actually 27,180 or less to qualify for Clipper Start. And so, um, I think Director Salzman is right in that there are still a lot of in real life actual low income folks that might not meet these definitions, as Alita may say, um, that might not meet these definitions who are still going to be incredibly impacted by a 5.5% increase. So um, I'd like to see you know a few other lower numbers thrown out, acknowledging the significant impact that does have on our fiscal outlook. With that, um, thank you so much for your work. Director Foley. Thank you, Chair Dufty. Um, first off, thank you, Pam. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate the uh, the overview, the projections, the highlights, the sobering news. Um, could you bring up slide eight? And, and the reason I ask is that you know, we have folks, pundits, whoever, trying to tell us what ridership will look like, what it is, what it's going to be. Um, I think the reality of, of slide eight is that um, this is what reality is. I get job offers a couple of times a week. And one of the selling points is fully remote, fully remote. I don't even look at another job offer unless it says fully remote. 
And the number of jobs that are fully remote is increasing all the time because that's what the workforce is wanting. For those people like myself currently who come to the office, it's 40 to 60% of the, day, of the week, two or three days. So that band of gray, that 40 to 60 is, I believe, what the next decade shows us as the new normal. People will come into the office two or three days a week. So I think we have almost captured or recaptured all of our commuters that are going to work. I don't know that we have more bandwidth to accept new workers into the system because I don't think they're going to work more than 40 to 60% of the week. So for me to support this budget going forward and maybe to what DGM Jones said um, earlier about bringing us some thoughts and ideas at the next board meeting, really with this budget, I need to understand what we are doing to reinvent BART. If I don't have that, I cannot support this budget. I do support the two raises of fares over the next two years. I'm supportive of what staff's proposing. Um, but I need to know what we're doing to, to increase ridership. How are we getting more people onto BART and in the cars? Um, I know at the workshop, I threw out the idea of half price weekday fares, reverse commute. I need to see ideas as part of this budget as to how we're gonna attract riders. Um, earlier weekend service, uh, as I mentioned at the workshop, I can't take BART to go on a trip on, at the airport because we don't run early enough on the weekends. Um, more frequent night service. We need the frequency to improve for folks to choose BART as an option other than Uber, other than taking a car. So for me, this budget, while palatable, I can't accept it until I see what's the plan that goes with this to get riders into the system. I need those ideas clear and present for me to be able to support this. Thank you, Chair Dufty. Thank you. Director Allen? Thank you, Chair Dufty. Um, first, I want to thank Director Foley for the reality check. Um, I think we have not had enough of that discussion. Our industry has been permanently disrupted. I believe it's it's you know long term. Um, we've got to come up with that new plan. Um, I might disagree a little bit on on some of the ideas. So I'm going to start high level here. There are only two ways to impact the over $300 million per year of deficits that this agency is generating. You can increase revenue, you can decrease costs, okay? It is that simple, and we need to be focused on both. On revenue, until we can get a commitment of additional state or local taxpayer subsidies, we are left with primarily increasing ridership. We can do that by, with a continued strong focus on the rider experience and particularly on improving public safety and reliability. We have to run a good service or no one will use it. And I think we are, we are starting to come around to that concept. Um, it's uh, the, the focus on expanding service to bring riders back, I believe is the wrong approach because it just costs more money to expand the service and the amount of the cost is not it is far more than the revenue that's going to come from that. So that is the analysis I am looking for. What areas of our service could be expanded and what is the projected revenue and the projected cost of doing that? So if we're going to talk about expanding service, we have to look at both sides, not just the revenue. Um, you know, I just wonder, does anyone here understand uh, the, this concept of expanding revenue a little bit and expanding costs a lot, right? It's just going to make our problem worse. Um, you know, um, on the on the issue of the discounts and, and the fare increases. That's the revenue side, right? If we give a discount, we get less revenue. 
if we don't increase fares uh, as we had planned, as we've always done since I've been on this board, uh, we have less revenue. So we are adding to the deficit. Um, I am, I'm going to be supportive of, of the 5.5% increases both years. Um, I think really we are taking a leap by not sticking to our original plan of using CPI uh, increases on the fares. Uh, but I want to turn now to, to the consent agenda. It was mentioned by Pam in the beginning. Um, on our consent agenda, uh, item 5A contains a detailed quarterly report of our actual versus budgeted results. This is the actual for where we are today. Uh, actually, this, this report only goes through the end of 2022, so it is the six months of July 1st to December 31st. Actual resor results for this agency versus budget. In my opinion, that's what we should have been discussing here today, because that result did not come out well, and we are over budget. We are over budget on our spending, we are under budget on the revenue, and that equals deficits. Um, so just a couple of quick items there um, the, um, that are in that report. Here's some quick facts. Total labor, labor is over budget by $16.3 million for the first six months of this fiscal year. Overtime makes up $11 million of that overage. Total operating expenses are over budget by $10 million for the first half of fiscal year 23. The total operating deficit for the first half of fiscal year 23 is $168 million. If we annualize that, we would be looking at $335 million for the entire fiscal year. Now, I appreciate Pam and um, uh, Michael, you putting forth the ideas, and, and, and I'm sure your bosses are involved in this too, the ideas for um, dialing this back in the second half. Um, but so on the QFR, um, let's see. Uh, so on the QFR, there's also a projection column for the whole year. Okay. And that is what I believe is most important to this discussion of our budget that we develop, and I understand that's going to be incorporated into the next discussion. How did we do in fiscal year 23? Actual is what matters. Um, so that makes me wonder that we got these results for the end of December, the first six months, just a month or so ago, maybe a little more, we got our actual results. And already, um, staff has included a column that projects how we're going to dial back those expenses over the next six months, right? So we got six months of actual, and now we already have a plan for how we're going to dial that back. But we're already three months into that, right? And so I wonder, um, you know, if you can do that so easily, just dial back the next six months of expenses, then, you know, where have you been for the last three years? We should have been talking about this for the last three years of how we dial back overtime, how we dial back expenses. And I know that it has to do with the service because in 2021, we got a presentation that told us exactly how much these expansions of service were going to cost us, net cost, okay, net expenditure. And, uh, it, you know, this board voted for it anyway. Um, so we, we somehow managed to dial back 17 million out of the second, uh, second half of fiscal year 23. And if you were to annualize that over the last three years, we would have had another hundred million dollars that would have taken us into fiscal year 26. Um, but that's hindsight. Uh, and I'm wondering, um, I, I, I was going to ask you to go to slide five, but I'll just, I'll just make a comment. This is, this is about the the cut, the so-called cuts on slide five that are shown since our, our budget workshop discussion. Um, I'm sorry, but cutting allocations to reserves for pension liabilities and allocations to capital budgets and capital projects, um, those are not cuts, those are deferrals. Those things have to be paid for eventually. And all we're doing is deferring the paying for it and moving on down the road. 
that's not going to solve our problem. It just makes the future worse. Um, so here's my request. I think maybe you've said this, some of this already, but I'll say it um, since I wrote it out. <laughs> Um, I want to see a well thought out menu of items at the next meeting, at the next discussion of deep cuts that could be made and, and specific, with specific details. And I'm going to be asking to have conversations before the meeting about the specifics of these details. Um, we need to have a menu of things and be prepared for knowing, and I'm, I, I'm not even sure some of this analysis has even been done yet. It should have been. Um, but we need to be prepared for what we may need to cut. And I want to see that now rather than waiting until 2024 when we're sort of at the end of the runway. Um, and that would include levels of service, um, certain hours, certain lines, certain stations, whatever staff believes would be the the least objectionable cuts that could be made, but I want to see how we get to at least $100 million a year of cuts if that's what we end up having to do. So, um, you know, I know that you put forth some, some ideas like cutting travel and some labor, you know, overtime reductions, and again, I think those should have been done all along for the last three years. But this board has continued to increase spending over the last three years. And if you look at the operating expense line on one of the charts, I think it's eight or seven. Um, and I actually took that chart and I went backwards with it. Uh, the operating expenses have gone up every single year uh, since 2019. And we cannot keep on spending like it's 2019. We're going to run out of money in 2025. That's less than 24 months from today. Pam and Michael, I, I give you all, I mean, a round of applause for you because this is such a difficult situation this agency is in and you have worked so hard and thank you. And I am not in any way, uh, you know, blaming anyone for this, except that this board has to start really getting serious about cutting this budget. We cannot keep going up. Uh, I, I, I do believe that, Bob, this is really your job. And you're the one who's going to have to drive this. And I know it's, it's not easy, and I know that you've had some difficult times with this agency over the last few years, um, but this is where we have to go, in my opinion. I am not going to uh, support expanding service. I think it should go the other way. We should be looking at the least utilized service and start to look at how much can be saved from cutting the, those areas. Uh, and I think we have to continue increasing fares. So thank you. Seeing no other directors in the queue, um, there are a couple of comments I want to make. I may be lost in the fog, but I believe that most leadership in this agency understands um, the importance of reducing overtime. And I do believe that over the past two to three years that we've gotten a handle on it. Um, as Pam pointed out, some of it is capital, and so that helps to reduce the over overall amount. But we're facing the same thing that government is facing across this country, not just transit, but just across this country, the inability to fill vacant positions. And I do want to thank our assistant general manager, Alaric de Graffenried and his team. If, if we're getting down to 7.5%, that's a win for this agency. It enables us to reduce over time. It enables us to have um, better service, which is what's going to draw people to us. And I, I just think overall, a, a lot of the overtime is generated by things that we as directors want. We want visible presence of CSOs and of BART police officers and uh, other activity that is addressing the, what our writers complain about and have the right to complain about. And so I, I just want to underscore that um, my belief is that we're doing a good job and that if you look at those metrics that, that they're going to help us turn things around and help us be very competitive 
in an incredibly competitive environment, as Vice President Foley uh, posited. Um, so I also want to say that I'm, I'm prepared to vote for the 5.5% over the next you know, two years. I, th I, I think it would be irresponsible to turn over to future generations of directors um, you know, doing what was done to us and, and to more recent board members where, um, you know, we, 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 they weren't taking the tough votes and providing the building blocks to go forward. Um, I am hopeful that things will improve in terms of ridership, recognizing it's going to be slow. But I also know that a lot of the people that I work with and know um, are talking about the fact that many companies are trying to draw back employees if only for three days a week. And um, yes, there are going to be fields in which people can work remotely, but I think that there are other uh, fields that require um, collegiality and collaboration and things of that sort. Um, so uh, I, I just want to be um, realistic, at least around the discussion of over time, it is much more nuanced than just saying that we've got to cut it. It's understanding that I think that we're making the right decisions and prioritizing things so that in the long term, that you know, I would stack our numbers up against a lot of other transit agencies. It's probably not worth the time, but I think if we looked across the board at comparable agencies, I would think that we're probably the top one or two in terms of managing over time based on what our staff has done. So I appreciate this is a difficult conversation and some difficult decisions are gonna to need to be made. And uh, on that note, um, we can complete this item. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Dufty, for bringing us through the admin committee. And thank you so much to staff. Um, now we will move, uh, there are no PPAL items. Um, so we will now move on to 11 board members. As usual, I will ask my board colleagues to combine their board member reports. We'll call for introductions and in memoriams, um, and we will do that before entering closed session. So uh, I, I can't see the screen right now of who would like to speak, so I'm just sort of looking around. Uh, Director Rayburn. Thank you, President Lee. On the 30th of last month, I attended the Compto Women's History Month, where I heard gratuitous remarks about BART's equity programs. This is I, I can't help but think of seeing Laverta Allen this morning and looking back to 2011 when I first entered the board, joined the board, um, we were not at that happy place that we were with Comto the other night. Um, on the 31st, I attended the Hayward Chamber Gala and I was honored to be seated with council members Sarah Andrews and Roach. Um, plus the newly appointed supervisor, Alicia Marquez. And so that's uh, the extent of my reports for board members. Thank you, Director Rayburn. Director Sol uh, Simon. <clears throat> Actually, I have three quick things. In memoriam, I think I join in um, <clears throat> with all my colleagues um, to um, extend our condolences to Bob Lee in San Francisco, who was murdered um, over the last week. And um, like many folks who had worked with Bob, not just in tech, but in social causes, um, his death was not only tragic, but a deep loss to our community. And he was murdered in District 6, um, in San Francisco District 6, but uh, the three of my colleagues who represent San Francisco so share friends and family who knew Bob. Um, <clears throat> secondly, I wanted to let everyone know that, and um, our our um, wonderful staff have been tweeting about this. Thank you, Alicia. Um, the um, two basketball teams from Tech and Ojai um, won national championships, and we will be celebrating um, their amazing win this Sunday. Um, and you know, go Oakland, go young people. Many of those young people ride our system every single day, and I do want to say that Oakland. Uh, in terms of young people, they are stellar, amazing young people who are oftentimes discredited, um, but they are amazing, they are thoughtful, they are smart, and they um, represented uh, <clears throat> our Bay Area beautifully throughout the nation, so I'm very proud of them. And lastly, uh, Alex from Rod's team and I 
um, joined the mayor of Oakland and um, uh, our uh, city councilman, Kevin Jenkins, and met with um, 30 plus families in West Oakland last week who were displaced by the Coliseum Connection. And it was a very long and, and difficult and beautiful meeting um, where for the first time the mayor's office heard um, what was happening with, with those families um, who were displaced from our BART TOD. Um, and I'm, I'm very, very thankful for Alex's participation. Um, and again, we were there to simply sort of sit and again, listen and bear witness um, to residents that we do care deeply about. And although we're only a transit agency, it's really important that we stay connected um, to understanding um, the pathway to their wellness um, and to hopefully some a, a just end to what I do, and I will say, <clears throat> and be very, very adamant about um, to uh, their relationship to a developer who seems um, to be extremely antagonistic towards their uh, their current conditions. It's it's been pretty horrific, and they've been extremely disrespected. So, I've, I I'm very proud that Bart continues to uh, again bear witness to um, what those uh, residents, their children, uh, the seniors that many of them are caring for, uh, their pathway. That's it. Thank you, President. Thank you, Director Simon, and I'm so grateful for you um, in joining staff and really the community and the residents in that meeting. Um, I'll work with the GM and perhaps with you offline in figuring out uh, the appropriate way to update the board on that. While I think we've done and gone quite above and beyond, I think with Calcium Connections residents, um, in meeting the needs where possible. I think we all personally, emotionally care about those displaced residents. So let's maybe figure out what that looks like, a memo or part of GM's report or something. Um, any other board colleagues uh, wishing to make any uh, reports? Um, oh, yeah, Director Ames and then Director Allen. Thank you, President Lee. Yeah, um, I attended the Hayward Gala as well on March 31st. And I sat with the Chamber of Commerce and some business owners, so that was really nice. Thank you, for Bart, for um, allowing me to attend that. And I also, I um, on Tuesday, went to the Senate Transportation Committee and spoke in favor of SB 827. Thank you. Dr. Allen? Yeah, just real quick. I did a presentation to the Lafayette uh, Chamber, um, I'm sorry. Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors uh, last week. Thanks. Great. Um, do we have to take public comment on this item? We just call for public comment. We don't have anyone on Zoom or in person who would like to speak on this item. OK, great. Um, with that, we will close this item. And we will now enter a closed session. Oh, sorry. My bad. Um, we actually have one more in memoriam before we close this item. I would like to pass it over to GM Powers. Thank you, Board President uh, Janice Lee. <clears throat> Once again, Robert Powers, Bob Powers, BART General Manager. I have an in memoriam for Elsa Lamb. And um, Elsa Lamb is the mother of Sylvia Lamb. And so let me just read a few comments here. So last month, the mother of our Assistant General Manager of Infrastructure Delivery, Sylvia Lamb, uh, sadly lost her mother, Elsa Lamb. Elsa was born in Germany where she met and married her husband, Virgil Lamb. Uh, he was in the U.S. Army and stationed there. After his assignment, um, Elsa immigrated to the United States with her husband and they made their home in Price, Utah. Elsa held a bachelor's degree and was trained in two vocations, but her passion was being a florist and she worked many years in Europe and in Price, Utah, caring for plants and flowers and providing joy and comfort to those who received them. It's with our deepest condolences. Uh, we, our heart goes out to Sylvia and her family. So thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for bringing that forward and you have our deepest condolences. Thank you. Um, with that, we will close board matters. Um, and we will now enter a closed, se closed session. Um, I think we do have to take public comment for either of our closed session items, A, public employment, and B, um, conference with legal uh, counsel. Do we have any public comment? 
Seeing none in person or online, we will now enter closed session. Thank you.
we have general counsel. Do we need general counsel? Okay. All right, um, thank you. We are now returned from closed session. Um, there are no announcements from closed session, so we can now adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, I can sign all of these things. Do you have a pen? Um, yeah. Can I have